Like that's the downside of E46s. Is they're just kind of ugly. Like I don't love, <laughs> I don't love how my car looks. I don't love how anybody's E46 looks. You can buy it's like a Camry bushing on Amazon for like 20 bucks. No way. And it's spherical, so it's like a legit bushing, yeah. and it presses into the trailing arm perfectly. So what does it mean about me as a person if I lose? Does that mean that my best, my all, everything I've done these hours on the sim, hours building this car, does that mean like it's just not good enough? That's how. I see a losing an FD. Welcome back to the number one drift podcast on YouTube presented by Njuku Racing. My name is Dawson and today we have Jeff Donati. Hell yeah, I appreciate you coming. Uh, before we get into the podcast, of course, look below the video. Make sure that subscribe button is not still red. If it is, go ahead and hit that and hit the bell notification while you're at it so you never miss an episode. Uh, don't forget, also, we are doing the Bums giveaway each week. So until the end of March, all you got to do, like and comment on each podcast and you'll get entered each week. Uh, and then, of course, grab the merch if you haven't already. If you can't, I understand that. I appreciate you watching. And if you have grabbed it already, thank you. Yeah, that's all I got. Just if you want to give a little bit of introduction on yourself. Yeah. Jeff Donati. I'm a Formula Drift Pro Spec driver. I drive a 2000 BMW. E46, 2J. Um, tried and true. Yep, tried and true. Been driving for, this will be my 10th season or 10th year, 11th season, if you want to get technical. Damn, it's been that long. Yeah, man, I've been right. doing it for a minute. Um, fourth year in FD. Um, other than that, I'm a cybersecurity engineer during the day. Oh, little, okay. little white collar boy. So Hell yeah, big brain. That's how we pay for everything. <laughs> um, computer nerd, basically, by by trade and um other than that i love to skateboard snowboard and Sick. just have fun dude snowboarding is one thing i wish i did more of yeah man i love, I love that what like okay so actually i'm gonna touch on that real quick yeah um what all like do you do in snowboarding like does that make sense like do you do the big jumps do you do yeah you just yeah i mean I'm so curious. i've been i've been skating and snowboarding since i was eight so like almost 22 years now Okay. Um, so I started skating in the summer when I turned eight and then I skied before that. And then in the winter I was like, oh, I want to start snowboarding now because obviously yeah, yeah. I started skating <laughs> and then, yeah, I, I mean, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so there's really not many Hills out there. So the little like mm. resort we do have, they really always had good terrain park, like rails and jumps and stuff yeah, because yeah. you're not really having much exciting just hills yeah so um <laughs> i did grow up you know park rat as it were and i was lucky enough to always go out west for spring break with my parents and ride mammoth Sick. lake tahoe colorado stuff like that so i did my fair share of the big jumps and all that stuff but nowadays i like to just go fast have fun be creative yeah keep it more chill and it's a blast Oh yeah, I'm always curious because like there's only so long you can do all that stuff before it really starts weighing on your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> your clutch leg is like <laughs> shit now, you know. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Hell yeah. Well, um, okay, then give us a little bit of rundown on the pro car. Uh, just more in depth setup on it. You know what? Yeah. Angle kit, suspension, all that stuff. Yeah. So basically, at a really high level, it's everything I like from Dylan Hughes' car and everything I like from Travis Reeder's car. Um, so combined. It's a good combination. To uh, go with. <laughs> my philosophy in in drifting, especially competitive drifting, is you never want to reinvent the wheel. You just want oh, to take no, what you no, know no, works no. and copy that as best you can. Like my old S14 was half Odie, half that Matt Field. I <laughs> so, love that car. Thanks, man. So I've always just been a fan of taking what works and applying it with my own little you know tweaks here and there. So yeah, it's a 2000. BMW 323ci, so the most like cheap basic version yep. you can get. I bought it from a buy here, pay here, running and driving with AC, five speed. Like it was kind of a sweet <laughs> car, it. Um, but it was absolutely trashed on the inside. But it was a Georgia good. car, so it was clean underneath, which was yeah, yeah also so no, good. not really rusted or anything. Like yeah, that. Um, and then obviously I was I've been an LS guy my whole life or my mm -hmm. whole drifting career for the most part, so. I wanted to go LS originally, but the more I looked into LS swapping those cars, 
first of all, there's not as many like swap kits for them as I thought there would be for LSs, as there is for like an S chassis, where yeah. there's like a million different brands and a million different ways you can do it. But I was just not impressed with the stuff I saw. You couldn't buy off the shelf headers that I thought were big enough for what I wanted to do. And the more I started oh, going down the rabbit hole, it's like the complexity and the cost is actually going to yeah. approach that of a Jay-Z because I've always wanted a Jay-Z. Ah, um, okay. I've never had one before. I had one for like a very short time in a 1JE36 I ended up selling to Chelsea Denofa. Mm. That, that was kind of the car that made me like love BMW chassis. Nice. Okay. But I was like, let's just do a, a Jay-Z in this thing because yeah. – it already came with an inline six, so it's going to package better. Having a cold side and a hot side on a motor for me is like huge because I was sick of, you know, with especially with ProSpec, you have to run this, uh, you can't run a pedal box. So the master cylinders have to be, right. yeah. They, I guess you would maybe not do this, but they have to be in the engine bay. Yeah. yeah so yeah, they're yeah. going to get, they get hot when you have a V8. It's just the heat management's a nightmare. And, having a cold side God, i love that you're saying this right like, now i fucking love this <laughs> having a cold side where you can like put all the important stuff power steering brakes clutch yeah. like that really was enticing to me so i'm like let's just do it um so i did go with the 2j and it obviously the cookie cutter fd stuff gsr winners the little radium five gallon fuel cell in the back seat like everybody does um rear mount radiator uh yeah it's pretty simple out back though. Like I run, I actually do run a divorced spring and shock still. So it, I have oh, literally wow, really? one aftermarket arm in the back just for what camber. Um, and Wait, okay, hold on. So you don't have like any rear alignment adjustment. So the, the BMWs prostate. are easy because they the trailing arm, the bucket is where you adjust the toe. So okay. where the trailing arm goes up into the chassis, that's how you adjust toe in and out. So you basically just get an aftermarket piece that has bigger slots so you can move it more. But what I do, because I'm ultra simple, is and my buddy Chad Anderson yeah. with the Coyote Swapped E46 to put me onto this. There's like you can buy it's like a Camry bushing on Amazon for like 20 bucks. No way. And it's spherical, so it's like a legit bushing. Yeah. And it presses into the trailing arm perfectly. But if Dude. the trailing arm pocket is like this, like if the trailing arm bushing originally is like this thick, the Camry one is like that. So what you can do is you can offset it in the trailing arm to get more toe in naturally. What? So <laughs> all these dudes, like no, code. <laughs> like no hate to anybody out here, but they're spending all this money on these like crazy arms and this like the wise fab arm which you can't even yeah. use the benefit of the wise fab arm in fd because you're not allowed to change the pickup point of the trailing arm in that bucket at all so you just do these 20 dollars bushings and these like you know 75 dollars brackets to yeah. have more toe adjustment and i can get like an inch total toe in which is like way more than you would ever need for a, B a bmw That's and it's crazy. like 20 bucks and i get the trailing arms they're 330 trailing arms because you have to run the bigger wheel bearing and hub because yeah, the yeah. big axles so i run a 330 trailing arm which i get on ebay from junkyards Dude. <laughs> um the amazon prime bushings and mm -hmm. i run a since it's a divorce spring and shock you can run a stock arm for the spring but on BMWs, those stock are aluminum and they bend really easy. Mm -hmm. And when you run those like big, you know, WiseFab or G-Force or drive shaft shop axles, they hit the arm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So somebody found out that you can, that a like BMW X3 yeah. has a steel arm that you can use for the spring. And it's the same yeah. dimensions. It's the same everything. And it's like super strong and they're 30 bucks. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> they're literally Dude, BMWs, new. I swear, are way more like Legos than the whole LS stuff. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that is nuts. There's so much you can do. So yeah, $30 upper arms. And then I had my buddy basically just chop them up so the axle fits, Yeah, which you're, you're basically just like notching it so the axle fits. Because especially because the winners sits up so high, the axle like angle it's yeah, like yeah. pretty 
the diff is not sitting super low is what I'm trying to say. So the yeah. axle can get close to that upper arm. So you just notch it and it's good. And I was worried that after we cut a bunch out, it was going to be weak. But like when I smacked the wall in Atlanta this year, Didn't I'm move. still, I'm still running that <laughs> same upper arm that I that literally yes. hit the wall and like <laughs> That's crazy. literally totaled the car. And that upper, that thirty dollar upper arm is like rock solid still, and I'm like, Whatever. dude, that's budget shit. That's is okay. So stuff like that is the reason why they would say that the E46 is probably the most budget friendly chassis to go with. Yeah, I mean, it feels like it's that perfect that's, mix dude. of it's like I'm an S chassis guy, you know, historically. And the E46 chassis feels like a more modern chassis, like mm. not as much of a tin can. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but it's still priced well, and you can still there's OEM parts like steering racks for S chassis was always a nightmare for me. Yeah. Finding steering racks, having spares. Obviously, there's a lot of people that rebuild them, but like that was always painful. Now I go to the junkyard and pick them for forty bucks out of E46s all day long, Damn. and they're better than rebuilds because BMW obviously knows what they're doing from the factory. Yeah, so it's like. Yeah. It's that perfect mix of still budget. There's still parts available. Everything fits well. Like trans tunnel is big. I didn't have to modify the trans tunnel at all for the the GSR or anything. Obviously the GSR is small, but all we did is just cut the top out and yeah. put a little plate because the GSR is a top shift and just little things like that. Because with an S chassis, you're cutting out the cat hump. You're yeah. doing all this doing stuff all for it. Shit. And it's like you it's just annoying. Um <laughs> So the B and the like, especially with an S chassis, you're spending thousands of dollars on rear suspension. Yeah. Right. If you can even finding rear subframes is getting hard for those cars and you have to re-engineer how the rear suspension works to get it to work. And then obviously if yeah. you're doing competitive driving, you're going to need two of everything at least. Yeah. That so a fucking nightmare. You and might, the S chassis like aren't even really marketable as much anymore. So there, there really almost no reason to go S chassis. It is. Yeah. I mean, too. it's definitely. I love them still. I want to build another one, but like, yeah. and they are they are really easy to make look good. Like that's the downside of E46 is they're just kind of ugly. Like I don't love <laughs> I don't love how my car looks. I don't love how anybody's E46 looks. Besides, like obviously the pro E46s can look better, like Reader and and, and Dylan's cars because they can run such yeah. a big tire that they can have like sick fitment and like still have like a wide body, whereas. On our cars, we're stuck with 255s. Yeah. And yeah. the thing for me, like for me personally, I notice rear spacer a ton with how mm -hmm. the car drives. So, and I like my car with not a lot of rear spacer in it. Yeah. So, like, it's just not going to look that cool. Like, it's just not. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going to have sunk fit, man. Yeah. It is what it is. You know, it's just going to look bad because you're running this little dinky tire and, um, it's convenient in some ways, right? Like yeah. I buy my front bumper on eBay for 200 bucks, side skirts on eBay for a hundred bucks, stock rear bumper. It's just like two F rear quarters and trunk. Dude, that's so cheap. Like, cause that's crazy. It's, yeah. And it's really nice. Cause you're not worrying about messing up fiberglass or yeah. anything like that. Like I'm still running all the parts that were involved in that crash in Atlanta fenders, <laughs> Like the metal part of the fender I replaced for like a hundred bucks because you can buy them like the you know the Chinese or Taiwanese like Fuck stamped you. Re, you know like re, <laughs> reproduction ones and then you just the fiberglass piece you just put it right back over top and yeah. like yeah it's it's so easy and the front suspension is super simple too like having the stock knuckle and just a bolt on like adapter to the bottom with the aftermarket control arm oh no shit. what bolt on kit do you have wise fab, wise fab they're okay. pretty much all like i think josiah is now doing a aftermarket knuckle but yeah. all the big like slr wise fab and i think even josiah has a product that just bolts onto the factory knuckle mm -hmm. and that's like more than enough and the front steer like that car being front steer alone is like amazing where the, obviously the rack is in front of the yeah, pivot yeah. point of the knuckle um because it's so much less stress on the steering components and you're not worrying about over centering like my old s chassis those i ran wise fab v1 back in the day because that's like really all there was back then they had just come yeah. out with v2 but v2 had a lot of problems so this guy um nate that owns his company bink industries mm -hmm. which he's kind of taking a step back from that to do other stuff now but he worked with Odie a lot and they did like a v1.5 wise fab or whatever and <laughs> that's what i ran and it was so it fixed all the problems that wise fab had 
but it was so stressful on the steering components that yeah. like yeah. it was like you see it all the bad crashes in fd are when power steering fails oh yeah right because yeah. it's that's just so literally the, the last issue i'm dealing with on my car i can't get the fucking power steering to work yeah and power steering has been the bane of my existence for a long time like i feel like i was nate and i were kind of on like the leading edge of power steering stuff back in the day with like this wise fab and s chassis stuff but like that's yeah. not even a consideration with bmws it's just it's so much less stress on the steering everything works fine I mean, you can see it's good because that's what Wise Fab's putting on their S chassis stuff. Oh now. yeah, <laughs> like, of course. And on their uh, Toyota stuff with like the eight sixes and whatever those all those front rack kits, I think use E forty six racks and pretty much yeah. copy the E forty six. So that to me alone was huge because, like I mentioned, that E thirty six that I had for a minute, it yeah. had like pre production SLR. Like this car was built forever ago, and it had never been touched since. <laughs> And it was like, I didn't, I didn't even align it. Had like an inch of toe out. Who even know in the in the front? <laughs> oh, like, shit. who even knows what was up with this thing? The arms were bent. It was a mess. It's a nightmare. And it was the most like buttery smooth, like amazing driving car wow. ever. Like, what the hell? It was so perfect. And I was like, okay, this is legit. <laughs> you know, um, and that's what because for me, like simplicity mate you know reliability those are all the big things for oh me. an fd yeah you're definitely gonna want that yeah uh, so out here in the grassroots world <laughs> we tend to <laughs> not take a part in that but yeah um well speaking of all like because we mentioned a lot of restrictions on fd and stuff what what are your opinions on a lot of the different rules that apply to prospect or ugh, prospect uh versus pro one basically i think some of them make sense i think some of them don't like for example the ecus all having the same firmware yeah that makes sense because they do lock out some stuff to make it simpler i don't think a lot of prospect guys have the resources to even really take advantage of everything even if those ecus weren't running that spec firmware yeah but that's another another conversation <laughs> um but i like that mm -hmm. i like the tire I really, I really think that Prospect's in a good place right now. I know there's conversation about we need to make the car slower in Prospect or whatever, but I think the tire is good. I don't agree with the steering column rule. I think that's a pretty, like for me, I have long legs. A, yeah, lot, of guys, yeah. a lot of guys have this issue where it's like, I have long legs, but I also like to be kind of close to the wheel. So I can't, I always have to compromise on my driving position with a stock column. Thankfully, oh, the E46 sucks. columns, once again, I retained the factory like tilt and telescoping so I can like <laughs> pull it towards me. Like it's so sick. Hell yeah. Um, That's all. Wait, how did. So it's, it's still just all mounts up the same, right? Yeah, you it's all just, like factory just, just mounts. Bolted? Basically, yeah. Oh, but fuck yeah. yeah. Why, don't more, why don't more people do that? And I just like, you just have the little lever, you drop it down, and you're like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, this feels pretty That's good. That's perfect. Yeah. So luckily, I, I got lucky there, but it's a really big safety concern, I think. And I, because obviously, gotcha. if you're like with the wheel close to you and you get in an accident, you want that to like collapse. And obviously, the factory columns do have that. But in drifting, it's like, because the, I asked Kevin this a long time ago in a town hall. I was like, what's your vision for Prospect? Like, do you want, are you slowly, implementing these rules so in five or six years when you get a license you just wire fd 70 grand and they send you a car in a box to put together you know what i mean like what is That's the hilarious. you know like <laughs> what is you know, being pro spec you know how spec are you trying to get yeah. and he's like no like he didn't really i like kevin but he didn't really have a great in my opinion like reasoning for why he wanted because at this point the big conversation was they were talking about making everybody have a front mount radiator Oh, which wow. we were like, we're like, uh, what? Are you gonna pay <laughs> everyone to change that? Like, first of all, Fuck. that makes a lot of swaps not feasible anymore. And it's like, okay, so the tiniest little wreck, you want to be cleaning up water or whatever? Like, that's a nightmare. Nobody wants yeah. that. So that luckily didn't get implemented. But I was like, what's? I was trying to pick his brain. Like, what's the point of these? And he yeah. was just like, I ought to like save money and make it simpler. I'm like, dude, we're already spending like hundred grand on these cars. Like, you really think a three hundred dollar column is gonna make or break <laughs> us? Like. It, like I, I didn't, I don't yeah, really buy that. You know, it's not like, and the other, the big one is, oh, you can't have a sequential transmission, which mm -hmm. I don't think that, like all the top teams in pro one have 
H patterns anyway. Like everybody's yeah, using an H pattern. I know people that strictly drive grassroots events that have that. Yeah, so it's like no point whatsoever. But yeah, so but the the thing with the sequential though that does make some sense is you can run a sequential and not have to do a quick change. Well, yeah. And if yeah, you price yeah. out a sequential and a quick, like you could probably get a Samson a six speed for like ten grand, maybe fifteen at most. And that's obviously maybe wrong now because it's been forever. But um, <laughs> someone will let you know. You could comments. go out and you can probably get a six XD, which is the most gangster sequential built by RTS for like twenty grand. I mean. I know that when I bought my H pattern GSR and winners and axles and everything from RTS, I yeah. spent the same amount of money. So you can like, you can pick and choose offset the cost. Like I know Garrett Denton who came up with me in pro uh, pro am and then did pro spec in 2018 and 19. Yeah, yeah. He did that where he had a Samsonist with like a, G, a GTR diff. Mm. So he was able to save the money on the winners and all that complexity yeah. to just have a stock diff, a stock diff with the sequential. And then it's even easier because, oh, I need more wheel speed. I'll just grab another gear, you know, cause you can make the ratios, whatever you want. So they can be pretty close ratio. So it's like, oh, I'll yeah. just start in second and I go to fourth. Be, yeah. A better way to approach that, especially um, on a lower budget. Yeah. It's like a different way. So I'm like, even that rule, it's like, I could see because obviously there would be everybody out here running sequentials with winners and yeah. like I get but you could always write a rule where it's like if you have a sequential you can't have a winners that yeah see that you know, would make like, more sense like, um, I could see that definitely but otherwise I think the prospect rules are okay like the pedal box and the column rules those are the only ones where I'm like does it really matter does that really matter yeah. like if your justification truly is we're trying to keep it simpler and reduce costs like Get us cheaper tires, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> like we're spending $130 a tire. Yeah. Everybody is. Mostly everybody is. Yeah. You know, so like that's our biggest. Two tires is a steering column. <laughs> like, you know that's what I mean? Fair, yeah. Um, and they're gone in two laps. So that's the only thing that I don't necessarily agree with. But for me, I've always built my cars with stock stuff anyway. Like my S chassis before when those rules weren't even a thing had a stock column and stock pedals. Yeah. Just because yeah. it was easier. More convenient. And yeah. Shit, yeah. So... Is there anything in FD besides like that stuff, like the way they run the events that you think could help the prospect drivers a little bit more? Because, I mean, obviously, it, this prospect guys aren't getting as much of the spotlight or anything, but like, is there stuff that gets in the way of making an event better for everyone? So I have a theory about prospect that, so right now it's very like sink or swim. You get your license, which depending on the year, it could be easy or hard or whatever. And then you're in FD now, like yeah. sick. I'm in FD. You show up. There's no, like they try to have quarterly meetings with us and be like, or like especially in the spring before the first round, they're like, okay, guys, like here's like a very high level. I don't even want to say what to expect. They just kind of like cover like yeah. very basic but, stuff. But I mean, there'll be guys showing up to the first driver's meeting, not in their race suit, which like. <laughs> When you've been in it, you're like, no, but how are they supposed to know? You know what I mean? That is true. Like yeah. I learned in Pro-Am coming up because, you know, I, I came up with like Nick Swan in Pro-Am and he's a huge like suits oh, on yeah. in the driver's meeting yeah. like, kind of guy, which I, that was in my head. But there's a lot of guys like don't know that. And that's just like one little example. I think Prospec, I think FD should really invest in making Prospec less of a competition like not less of a competition i still want it to be a top 32 yeah but yeah. it to focus on like how can we make you guys better okay let's try to elevate this field as a whole yeah and give you guys the resources to succeed and almost it be like an incubator for really good drivers what well, how like in what platform design would you be able to do that other than competing against each other. No, I think that should stay have, the same. Yeah. That shouldn't change. But like everything else, like I've always, I've, I want to talk to Sage about this because I would love to do this for FD is be like the pro spec liaison or like a pro spec okay. mentor where when I'm done, come in and be like, okay, guys, I'm going to be your one stop resource for anything you need. And I'm going to have meetings with you and say, okay, before the first round, this is what you guys need to expect. You need to be professional. You need to have this set up. 
Make sure you're reading the rule book. There were guys showing up to Atlanta last year that had single outlet brake masters, which is like red flag 101 massively against the rules. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they're scrambling to find a brake master that's legal. And it's like, they, you get so little time to focus on driving because you're so overwhelmed with everything else, you know? Hmm. Okay. So what are, what are some other things that you've noticed, um, for or like to spill it out now then? Like, you want. I would just tell these guys, like, I would love to have, like, why is it so secret? What gears to run? What like tactics? All this that's stuff. a secretive thing in FD. Yeah, like like on purpose or just I mean, by like we'll talk about it. like in Atlanta last year we were thought I remember in the drivers meeting it was like Cody Buchanan, Corey Talaska, Dustin Miles, and I. Everyone was like, "What gears are you running?" Oh, okay, and so it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. but like, like you're still talking about you're it. not gonna like like for me when I, before Atlanta in 2018 my first year like I DM'd Reader on Instagram and I was like, "Hey bro, what gear should I run?" And he told <laughs> me, Fuck you know, yeah. <laughs> but like not everybody's gonna do that. And like I feel like there should just be more of an effort to make the driving better and make these guys be able to focus, like have a seminar on like, Hey, how do you get spot? How to get sponsors, mm -hmm. how to market yourself? Like none of this stuff, FD doesn't, they're yeah. willing to help you. Like Sage is super nice and very open and very willing to get, help you get the resources you need. But like, I think being it, being more proactive with that for the group as a whole, I think prospect should have a smaller, there's 47 drivers this year. I think prospect should be, 37 at most yeah um I agree, I agree with that i think that they should really focus on like let's have a small group of guys that we're going to really put a lot of time and effort in because we want them to be the future of fd yeah right now it's sort of okay there'll be a couple standouts every year right hobson obviously cole richards like cole richards gonna be an absolute dog and pro oh, um man. what's his name awesome. robert thorne like there's a couple guys that just bubble to the top mm -hmm. Or there's guys that like put in the work, like Brutsky, Derek Madison, those guys like put in the work and got really good. Yeah. Even though they didn't come out their first season and crush. They got good and now they're going to move up and do well. But it's like, in my opinion, prospects shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be just this like shit show of these guys figured out or these guys are apps. Like, remember that Mustang is like wheel fell off in Jersey or something? Yeah, it was like this yeah. huge meme. Like, that's not a good look for the series. And I think these guys. I now I will say sometimes. <laughs> okay, that yeah, shit's yeah, good. like that's they, good publicity. Sometimes I feel like we should have a little, like a couple more fist fights here and there. But um, <laughs> no, I like, don't know about all that. <laughs> but you know, when when there's some memes and stuff made. No, yeah, any public, you know, public, that's, you know really that's cool. good. That's good. But like, for me coming up in prospect, you're it's so hard to focus on the driving because you're yeah. so overwhelmed. So I would love to just be like, hey guys, this is what I've learned, this is like, I'm your resource. Mm -hmm. Like talk to them about, have a, have a meeting with everybody about like sponsorship 101. Cause not everybody knows this stuff or partnership 101. I know I'm saying the S word. Um, Sounds like you really just need someone dedicated to damage control. <laughs> damage or like be, pre, be proactive and like, just help these guys. Like, cause you put so much into it. Like I know how much yeah. you have to put every one of these guys that drives prospect is putting like 110% into this. No matter how much money you have, what you do for work, you have to put everything into it. Yeah. And there's just not a lot of room left to like think about the driving. And I think we should really focus more on making the driving better and, and taking a lot of the thought process out of it, process out of it with everything else and being able to give these guys an opportunity to really excel. Like I said have a partnership seminar, bring in a bunch of like marketing managers from these top companies and talk to these guys about how do you make a packet? How do you market yourself? I don't even, I mean, we can talk about partnership later, but like, I don't even think you just make packets anymore. <laughs> People are gonna be like, this guy's freaking stupid. But like, anyway. Oh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get into that. Um, stuff too. But like, talk to people about that. And then, talk to people like before each round, be like, okay guys, yeah. here's a high level overview of like how you can have success here. Here's a range of what gears you should run. Here's a high level strategy of how you should attack this course in the lead, how you should attack this course in the chase. Mm -hmm. Here's what you should be thinking about. Um, here's what the judges care about here. So you can be thinking about it so you can practice on the sim. And then be like, okay. And even before the first round, be like, all right, guys, you're going to get here. It's going to be overwhelming. Yeah. Like, you're not even going to know where to park. You're not going to know what to do. Just lay that all out for these guys so they can come in confident and not just be like, you know, if you have to devote brain power to thinking about where you're going to park, that's less brain power you can think to devoting to like, what am I do at this track? Yeah. Um, 
because like I said, it's so much. Like I, I was telling my girlfriend this the other day, like in the spring, I almost want to send out a mass text to all my friends be like, like reminder, the season is starting. Like if I don't text you back, if I can't hang out, like if I'm just like, like it's not personal. It just yeah, takes so course. much out of you to do this I'm stuff. Working. Yeah, like it's, you know, <clears throat> and all these guys, most guys in prospect have, you know, their full-time gig, like job themselves. So yeah, yeah, it's just so much to handle that I think that giving those guys more resources, and I don't know exactly what that would look like yet, but giving those guys more resources and sort of taking some of the mystery out of it would it make the series look better as a whole? Like, imagine if everybody showed up knowing what gears to run, knowing at a high level, like how to go around the track and being like, this is what to well, expect. He, that, that's why I talk about uh, keeping the show going like Driftmasters does and stuff. Because especially if you can, that would help correlate the prospect guys. Because like you said, it is just kind of like a shit show almost in prospect. So if a lot of those guys had the understanding of where to be, when to be, and like what exactly to do, even just wearing your fucking <laughs> yeah, like suit little stuff at the like driving that, you know? meeting, like that takes so much pressure off of everything else, and they can actually, again, like you said, focus on the driving and keeping the show operable, yeah. and then prospect gets more eyeballs, which gets more money, which more you know, the, yeah. the whole ripple effect. Yeah, like after I, that, I want prospect guys to be. I want the series as a whole, the prospect as a whole, to be as successful as possible. I want the competition to be gnarly, every single battle to be sick. I want all the teams to look professional. I want all of them to be, you know, well dressed and professional looking and organized. And like yeah. a lot of that stuff people don't think about. What does your pit space look like? What does your team look like? How are your guys acting? All of that matters. And FD's watching all of that. Mm. But not a well, what about the guys that are like extremely low budget and probably can't afford the nice pit space I mean, rig dude, and all that stuff? I've been the last the entire time I've done FD, I have a twenty four foot trailer, cargo yeah. trailer, Vina. Like it's it's not necessarily about like how gangster your rig is. It's just like no, not even how yeah, do sorry, you care? Not even rig technically. <laughs> yeah. that was my bad. I no, didn't say that. Uh, but like even because the tents, dude, the canopies, like just for a frame is like five hundred dollars. Oh yeah, you're getting a ten by twenty, which is probably what you need. You definitely need a ten by twenty. But like for for me, I've been borrowing a, a nice one from one of my sponsors for like the pit. Nice. Walmart has ten by twenties for cheap. I've been rocking a Walmart ten by twenty for a minute. Um, some Walmart ten by tens if you need it. Like, it's more like not what you have. It's like, how do you work with what you have? Yeah. And how do you, um, and I, I still want people to have their personality expressed through their programs, but in a way that is professional and exciting for fans yeah. and wants mm -hmm. fans to come in. Cause prospect obviously is always like the side mm -hmm. to, to pro. One thing I've always found unique about, um, like Japan FD and Japan and stuff like that is a lot of the drivers will put on this like character type persona and it really uh, it may not be like the most professional thing but it kind of is because it's attracting the younger generation to it so like the really young kids and I think that's kind of important and like when, how Andy does or yeah Andy does the whole wizard yeah. act I think that's good I for agree. driving I agree so, is that something that you wish to see a lot more, especially coming from prospect guys trying to make that name for himself? I think it's a balance. So yeah, like when I say professional, I mean like, um, like for example, I'll see guys at like SEMA and PRI with like stained sweatshirts on talking to partners. Oh, it's hell like, no. It's like, come on, come on. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't have to be like, you know, white collar sitting in the pits, like, you know, pro race team vibes, but just be like respectful of yourself. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whether you're like me and you're more of like a maybe traditional race team where we're kind of like goal oriented and like not as like not as Andy Hately it like. Yeah. Which I think is not a great thing that I'm like that, but it is what it is. But then there's people like Andy Hately that are having, you know, I'll this, shoot my own self in the foot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Andy Hately has these like really awesome, this really awesome like character. And I think there's yeah. a really fine line with that in FD with like, you're really flirting with being corny. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Like, and some people can pull it off. Yeah. Andy Hately is a great example of that. You know, that's like, 
textbook definition of how that should be done. But I think that people try to like, it, it's like this, I can't verbalize it, but like people will do things that are so gimmicky and like Dude, cringe. The ceremony right before the <laughs> uh, like top 16, yeah. stuff like, where they go to each driver. Dude, it's so fucking funny <laughs> watching them do their little bullshit right to yeah. the camera because they're like, it'll cut to them before they're like, they start it. So it's like delayed to doing whatever yeah, yeah, their yeah. little thing is and then they stop and it's just like an awkward second before the camera moves away yeah oh yeah. it's so cringy dude i hate that yeah like that kind of stuff is like ugh. or you know just trying too hard to be different in a way like i think there's it's a very fine line and no hate on somebody for trying if, yeah, if you yeah, try like something and it's means. corny you tried like yeah. there's still like still respect for that but improve it though <laughs> yeah you just keep doing it that's your own fault <laughs> um it's almost it's almost like it's just like people are trying to find this new way to crack the code to, yeah, to get yeah. partners and get popular and it's like i'm not saying don't try but at the same time like mm -hmm. think about how you're approaching it and i think it can get a little corny uh, sometimes which like that's my personal opinion that's not yeah, like mine too <laughs> <I> agree. <laughs> um, um but i'm very like you know, some may describe me as like having a stick up my ass. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, because I'm more like reserved and like the quiet professional where yeah. I'm just like, I love to talk to fans all day long. Like, yeah. if they want to talk about cars or whatever, but I'm not going to be doing like cartwheels in front of my car to like no, attract no. them. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no. no. Um, <laughs> I'm good on all that. Or I'm not I'm not gonna, you know, I don't have the personality like Haley does to be able to go up on the podium with a cone on my head. Yeah, and I, don't a staff. Have, I don't have the balls to embarrass myself. <laughs> yeah, like that if I try to do what he did, it not would look saying corny. you're embarrassing yourself, Andy. No, again, he, we everybody love what you do, you're good at yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> like if somebody tried to copy him, they would embarrass themselves because they yeah. don't they don't have what he has, you know. So uh, that's kind of my my thoughts on that. That's so fucking funny, dude. Oh my god. <laughs> Um, uh, okay. So, all right. So someone coming into prospect for the first year, like ever, uh, what would you say the ideal, like crew to have and like just set up going into FD? Like obviously parts wise, you two of everything's good to have, you know, you need your toolbox, your jacks, your jack stands, all that shit. Like besides the basic stuff, what is very important to have a part of your program going into that first year? So I don't think this is like necessarily achievable for everybody, but I think one of the biggest advantages you can have is have somebody that's been there before with you, whether that's okay. a, a spotter or a crew guy that's worked for other teams or just somebody that has been there is oh, huge. Dude, I say it all the time, no matter what you're doing, a mentor is the best yeah. thing to have. Having a mentor, especially one on your team, yeah. you really really powerful other than that i think it is important to have a car that can hang you oh, know yeah. um there's a lot of people that might show up to round one i would i would honestly put that it within like the basic necessities yeah. i mean people mess it like, up obviously. though <laughs> you'd be, i mean you'd be surprised that's like fair. guys that's will fair. show up and it's like dude um that's not gonna cut it um <laughs> but especially nowadays in you know back when i would started reader and hughes were destroying people with na ls's mm -hmm. in s chassis you know yeah. it's just not like that anymore um but i think having a team with some experience would be good i think having some knowledge of the tracks would be good like i think you need a simulator if you're gonna spend all the money to drive fd you need a sim oh, yeah. if you're not simming before a round like you might as well just i don't know not piss off <laughs> yeah like why would you not so like that a sim is really important having a good car understanding like the thing with fd is you have so little time to make any changes. Mm -hmm. You might get, especially in Atlanta, which is, I love it as a first round because it's like, all right, who's the men here? Or the <laughs> women, you know. Yeah. What You know what I mean? Men, it, se <laughs> it separates Not the guys that, yeah, it, it separates the guys that, the guys and gals that are prepared and are ready for it yeah. versus the guys that are like, you You can tell really early in Atlanta, like who's got it and who doesn't. Um, And the problem is, a lot of people go into the kitty litter in Atlanta, and this is really the whole the whole season. You don't get a lot of laps. Yeah. So knowing what changes do what on your car is really important in my opinion. Like, okay, if I make, and I don't think you should come in, like 
I think you should be making like tire pressure, mm -hmm. spacer, sway bar changes. Like know what changes you can do in line that okay. make big difference. You can't do spacers in line, but you can do tire pressure in line. You can do sway bar in line potentially. Yeah. You could make some shock adjustments in line, but just understanding what the different like a, what are the most common ones for you that you have to change in line? Tire pressure. Like usually. I keep that I keep it simple. Brian, who's my crew chief, is super technical. He came up with gotcha. me through Pro Am. He worked with um Dirk Stratton in Pro Two oh, nice. a long yeah, time yeah. ago. And then with me in Pro Two, like I said, in Pro Am. Then when I stopped in twenty nineteen, he worked with Sorensen's for a couple of years and then okay. he came back with me. So he has like all this super, he's super well versed on E46s and just chassis setup and stuff, particularly. But like, I like to keep it simple. Like, dude, let's just do tire pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't run a sway bar in the rear at all this year. I just, I have one. I just never felt the need to run one. Um, spacer, but like, really, it's just tire pressure and, and he'll make some shock changes. But yeah. Um, the way I see a drift car is like, if I'm imagining my car, it's just like a giant board of like knobs and switches. <laughs> you know and it's like what do these like when i'm thinking of suspension setup like what do these knobs and switches do okay like what does the rebound do what does the compression do yeah, yeah front and rear how does that what does that actually do i don't think people take enough time everybody before you show up to your first fd round should take your fd car go to practice day and just make crazy changes full stiff to full soft 30 psi to 15 psi in the tires one inch spacer to no spacer now you're, you're still like as in crazy changes you still mean like do them one at a time yeah don't do them like correct three, only don't change do five of them at a <laughs> yeah. time and then go see what happens only ever change one thing at a time but my theory is before you really are very in tune with your car make huge changes so you can see like it's really clear what that yeah. change is going to do when you're going to make that one make it very drastic so, okay yeah. so yeah so that's you can be like with the hard and soft for the yeah so you could be like okay in atlanta um i'm entering and i feel like the car doesn't have it doesn't want to slow down okay you know because you have that huge like down the hill throw it in whatever it's like oh the car doesn't want to slow down first of all you need to have the awareness as a driver to communicate that with your crew because mm -hmm. I think a lot of guys will just try to drive That's around stuff, to, okay. which is hard. It's a skill you have to develop. Not everybody, and I'm included, can come out and just be like, oh, it needs this. Is that a common problem? Where yeah. people just won't talk to their spotter like that? Or just like a lot of guys don't think it's the car. They just think, oh, I'm, it's just my driving. Okay, I um, can see that. That's just, that's some shit I'd do. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <So>. in, <laughs> in like 2016, when I was, that was my first year of Pro-Am, I didn't even have a tire pressure gauge. I was just like, let's do this, you know? <laughs> It was good enough for a couple, you know, it was good enough to, to you know, do pretty well, but still it's like, I was just like drive around everything. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people carry that mindset into, into pro and that's not, you know, conducive to having success. Um, Agreed. so being able to communicate that effectively with your spotter or your, your crew chief is really important and you don't, ha and having a crew chief that can take your feedback in plain English and translate it into what the car needs is even bigger. So I can tell Brian like, Hey, like literally like, Hey, it's not, I need more drive out of outer two. And he's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's a huge advantage versus like if I'm being able to, cause the question was what's important for a season, yeah, your first event, <laughs> like have crew that know the car as well as you do know what the changes make, being able to delegate tasks, be able to trust your guys with those tasks. That's huge. Because yeah. you're going to be, like I said, you're going to be so overwhelmed with all this stuff. Like when I show up, when I show up to my first FD, I'm like, that's Chris Forsberg. That's fine. You know, it's like the pressure starts setting. In. I was so, even though you're not driving with them, you're so starstruck that you're even like your trailers at the same parking lot as yeah. they are, you know? And it's like, I've heard that a lot from people in FD, especially uh, just having the right people there that can take the stress off of the minor little tiny bullshit that happens mm -hmm. at each event. Yeah. So I, I don't know, man. That's this seems to be the way to go. Like the deadly combo is like have a six. You have to have a great spotter. Yeah. And that spotter needs to be able to a effectively coach you around the track, mm -hmm. but B, I think off track they need to be like your shit shield to like anything that's like. Mm -hmm could affect you they are sort of like your handler they go in between yeah, yeah. you and everything else and then your crew chief has to be really in tune with the car so basically the spotter has to be really in tune with you as the driver 
the crew chief has to be really in tune with you, with the car. Mm -hmm. And that like three person triangle is deadly. Like, and it's not easy to find. Like I had to, I fired my spotter after Atlanta this year or last year okay. because I just didn't like, you know, he was a great friend of mine, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's not, that doesn't translate yeah. to being a great spotter. Um, I think for me personally, and everybody likes different things when it comes to spotting, like I want somebody that I respect, mm -hmm. that I'm friends with, but I'm not super close with. That, yeah, I agree. Um, and somebody, and also how they spot is really important. They have to give me like, anybody can go up there and be like, you were two feet off that clip. And it's like, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. thanks. Um, well, actually, that's something I wanted to touch on as far as the spotters go, because you, you'll, you'll see a lot of people that just do that, where they're just on the phone with you, basically. And they're just talking through what's going on. And then you'll see some people with like their fucking laptop out. They've got a notepad down. They're just writing every little tiny detail they can. What, I guess the way to frame that in, what do you find has worked best for your program and what the spotter does when he's in the tower or doing whatever, wherever he needs to be? So for me, it's like, You'll notice the top teams like Papadakis and RTR, they have a guy whose job is just to sit in the stands and film every run of every car. Yeah. And I think that's actually sweet because like for me, when you get a battle, so like, okay, I qualified whatever, here's my battle and my potential bracket after that. It would be yeah. sick to be able to sit down and be like, this is all of this person's practice runs. And then if you're spotter, I'm not saying that's required, that's like me, like that would be sick. What my spotter does that I like is he takes notes on every driver, high level notes. Like this is how they enter. Are they doing some crazy flick, yeah. straight line? How are how is that looking? And then um, they might time a couple guys to see how we are pace wise relatively. So like, oh, it took me ten okay. seconds to get from here to here. It took that guy twelve. Yeah, because like that matters. Like some guys drive really slow, which is fine, you know. Um, but if you're not ready for that. Like, look how, I mean, people might say that Nick Novak won Irwindale by driving a little slower. Yeah. He still won. Yeah. And you guys saw him drive slow from the date, from the first run of yeah, practice. That, oh, uh, we got it. When that happened, I can't remember who, what podcast it was, but we got into that. And it's like, yeah, he was driving slow, but at least. It was the entire time. Exactly. So you knew exactly yeah. what to expect. Mm -hmm. You just shot your own stuff in the foot exactly. by not approaching it correctly. Anyway, sorry. No, yeah, <laughs> like, no, I, exactly. Like you have the opportunity to collect that data. Yeah. You know? And I think it's rare that somebody would drastically change their driving style mid competition. Yeah. Most of us are just going to pick away and drive the all weekend mm -hmm. like that. So your spotter has plenty of time to figure that out. But for me, it's, it's more like the soft skills that I really like. It's how they communicate with me. It's making me laugh. It's making me feel like I'm the best guy out there at all times. Yeah. Like, even if I'm not, give always leading with a positive first. You know, being like, like for example, if I did a lap and somebody was like, that was rude, like the first thing they said was that was boring. That's not gonna make me better. Yeah. It might make somebody better, but not me. Yeah. So for me, it's like, I would need somebody to say, Hey, I loved how you went from outer one to outer three. It was super fluid. You hit all those zones great. But I think that you could be more committed on throttle through this section or something. Like yeah. make it always lead with a positive. Make me feel good about myself yeah. first and then tell me what I need to do better. Yeah. And I think that's something you can. That's something that I think just comes natural as a, you're learning to be that coach in yeah. a sense. Because. Um, Dude, anytime someone's come to me with like, you need to fix this, but oh, this was all right though. That just pisses me off. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. Lead with the positivity first if you can. Yeah. Lead Be with positivity. <laughs> like, get excited. Like, he, I let my spotter CMJ, he's like from Indianapolis and he's like so perfect. Yeah. Like, I see Like, he's so good. Him and Brian and I, like, we could take on the world. Yeah. For sure. Like, that, and it used to be, I used to have my spotter before was Jelani Winston, who's a like super OG guy from Michigan. And he was like the same way. Like mm -hmm. we were friends, but not like super tight, like best friends, which I think is perfect for a spotter. And he was, oh, he would always make me laugh. And he was so funny. And like that, he would make me laugh in a way that also made me feel like I was the best guy out there. 
Nice. And that's what I need. Yeah. Like that. I don't care. You could give me all the data you want on the guy. If I don't feel like I'm better than him, like it's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um and we could jack me up dog yeah like we could talk i want to kind of dig into that later too about just the whole like competition mindset but yeah like if i don't feel like i'm better than that guy then you're already losing you're already you know on your back foot yeah which is not always easy to do when you're lined up against somebody that's pretty good (laughs) (laughs) um but well before we touch on that what is, uh, as far as your own program, what is something you've noticed this year that you want to change for next year? So we really, every round we learned and we got better. Um, but I think the biggest thing for next year is just make everybody's life easier. We're, we don't want to fundamentally change everything or fundamentally change anything. The car is sick. The crew is sick. Um, I did get a bigger trailer, which will be really nice. But like... Nice. Um, that's probably the biggest change is going from that little bumper pull thing to like a proper gooseneck enclosed yeah. like 40 foot trailer. It's 40 foot now. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. That's yeah. a monster. Yeah. So, um, that's a, that's like a big material change we made, but what does that mean? It's making everybody's life easier. Not having to pack the trailer, like a yeah. can of sardines when you leave, have to unpack it like a can of sardines when you get there. Um, making the hot pit process a lot easier because a lot of times like in atlanta you're pitted you have like your cold pit your paddock whatever Mm -hmm. where your trailer is and then your hot pit like half a mile away a mile away like up a hill down a thing through a forest like over the hill yeah seriously (laughs) and sometimes you're having to pack up a hot pit the last few rounds were really easy where we didn't have to do this but like in atlanta was a perfect example you're like packing up and taking it back and then resetting it up multiple times throughout even a day even a day so having my guys because for me it's like i obviously i want to go there i want to have success but i want everybody to have fun and everybody to have like everybody on my team to have fun have like an enjoyable experience yeah and to be more efficient not just work 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 the entire time so like my hot pit setup was we got it more refined but getting that even better having like a pit cart style thing that is still Mm. budget friendly rome charpentier or charpentier showed me his which is like the perfect it's like a harbor freight toolbox where you basically like cut the legs off of it because it's like a toolbox on the top half and like storage on the bottom and you like cut that and weld handles onto it so it can come apart into two halves and you like set the top Ah. half in your truck bed then you set the wheels in your truck bed then you can because the hardest part is like dragging these toolboxes everywhere you see these these casters are like hanging on for dear life and like every it's a nightmare so i I don't want to have to drag a pit cart I want to be able to load it into my truck and yep. take it out I there agree. and like make that easier. Have a set of like for me, I would always take my toolbox that I have in my garage and like put it in my trailer, mm-hmm. which there's a lot of stuff in that toolbox that you don't necessarily need for an, a weekend. So yeah. like I want to have exactly. a set of tools and stuff in the trailer that's like, that's like what we need to do anything on the car and nothing more. So you're not having Smart. to like, you know, because yeah. that toolbox, we would leave it in the trailer and then I'd have like this smaller like craftsman like mini toolbox that we would like put the essentials into and take that out to grid but it's like you're loading that you're unloading that it's heavy it's awkward yeah. like annoying really streamlining that and then also like a, th- a thing that not a lot of people talk about is like just the logistics of the weekend mm-hmm. food um oh, yeah. how you're doing that like i typically will get in on like wednesday or whatever load in is and we'll get loaded in and then we'll go to the guys will go to the airbnb and then like i'll go to costco walmart get all the stuff but i want to even like more formalize that this year where it's like okay every round on wednesday night we eat this mm-hmm. on thursday night we eat this so like for lunch we do this so it's just taking that thinking out of it yeah, yeah. um making it super almost more itinerary based yeah like just very structured and taking all the you know i, I like people say like i wear the same thing every day because i don't want to have to put thought into what i'm wearing because everything else in my life is more important. You know, maybe like some yeah. businessman will say that or like I wear the same thing every day pretty much. And it's like, apply that to your program. Yeah. Because like I said, everything comes back to how much time can you focus on what you need to do in the driving? Yeah. Do you think like too much of that is can cause damage though? Because like when you said like have known what we're eating this day, this day, like do you think scheduling specific meals is like that might be a little much? For me, no, because it makes the grocery shopping easier. Because you go to yeah. Costco, you're like, oh, I need this, 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 this. I don't have to have a list. I know every, everything we get every round. Yeah. We just get that. 
all right, let me grab a pizza from Costco for the guys tonight. Okay, yeah. I got to go to Walmart. What do we need at Walmart? Boom, boom, boom. Because these are like Costco's and Walmart's are pretty much everywhere and they mostly sell the same stuff no matter where you are. So it's like, don't have to think about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, okay, what I don't do, know how any of this goes. Like, what so do we need at Walmart? I'm curious. You know, what do we need at Walmart? Okay, we need sandwich meat, buns, yeah. this, that. And then you don't have to be like, okay, what did we say we were going to eat on this day? You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, what are you guys feeling? <laughs> yeah, everybody, because the guys are simple. Ooh, you know, at the oh, end of the day, cool, you know, man. you know how drifting works. Like, dude, I'd eat anything. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, but also making sure the guys have like the right nutrition and knowing what they like. And that's why having a team that's like static for a long time is nice. Cause like, oh, Chris loves these Nature Valley bars. I'm going to make sure those come with us. Or CMJ loves yeah. Pepsi. I'm going to make sure that he has a lot of Pepsi. Brian loves gummy bears. Like having all that for That's them. also very good key th small things to think about as far as being a leader base in your program too. And just yeah. like owning a business, like if you have employees or some, like those minor little things are really good to focus on just to take yeah. care of your guys. Exactly. Cause like that stuff would stress me out this year, like, or last year thinking about like, are we going to forget anything? Mm. Are we going to, you know, not have what we need to do this? Whereas, cause we would kind of have like a general high level idea of what we we're going to eat, but we wouldn't have like, a, okay, this, like there were things that everybody liked, like everybody loved walking tacos. So we're going to have those at least one night, <laughs> but like, That's hilarious. um, you know, cause I, you know, you could go out and, get fast food or buy food or cater food but that's yeah. just so expensive i mean it's like yeah and then you're not gonna feel as great from exactly it you know shit food exactly so i like to because i do take the the health side and like the sports performance side of it pretty serious as well so i like to make sure like i'm eating good stuff the guys are eating good stuff i don't want them to be just like eating junk all weekend yeah. especially when it's super hot um Ooh, like yeah. i didn't have any ac in my trailer last Pedia year light on deck <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or even like making sure that you know, I changed my my nutrition philosophy throughout the year, like how I eat throughout the day and, and what I'm drinking and all that stuff. And I think it it really matters and it really helps. So making sure everybody's like yeah, eating good is is really important to me. But also, because like I said, the mental load of FD is so high that just taking variables out anywhere oh, you yeah. can is – and maybe I'm, I'm also somebody that like really values structure <laughs> and um, – that makes me because it's like what what's my mindset like anything that can make me come into the weekend with like yeah. the best mindset possible i'm going to try to do yeah so. so you're not good at winging it pretty much <laughs> no i don't like to wing it um i don't like to wing it yeah. <laughs> i'm very like give me my lists give me my schedules give me my you know like we'll print out schedules and everybody will get a schedule in their little armband and highlight the important times when's no the dryers shit. meetings when do we have to go out to grid like the little football sweatband yeah sweatband. yeah, yeah they pop the open their yeah, all right guys <laughs> that's awesome because um, i just want everybody you know that stuff to me like for example in in utah we were like we had to be at the track everybody had to be at the track by like seven for practice yeah. but we would be there at like five which you might be like, what, what are you doing? First of all, we're still on East Coast time. So for us, it was like eight. But um, I want to make sure that we're, everything's ready, prepared. Nothing stresses me out more than feeling like I'm behind. Yeah. You know, so that kind of stuff I really value just to keep my mindset dialed. Like, let's make sure the car is warmed up before we drive it out to Time's grid. The because the valuable like, thing, man. I hate feeling like I'm wasting time. Yeah. Or like, I need to have, for me, it's always this balance of like not, getting all my stuff on in the car too soon so i'm like sitting there, <laughs> yeah I've but i also don't want to feel like i'm rushing to like put my stuff on um so that's big for me too but yeah like that level of preparedness yeah. really helps me get in that i like zone. how strategic you take it you're very incremental the small I mean, details you spend so much money it's on this nice. stuff dude it's like i want to do everything i possibly point, can yeah. to be successful like you spend so much time so much money so much of your friend's time and money, so much of your family's time and money, like everybody around you, it affects your life and it takes a village. And it's like, why would you not want to do everything possible to try to be successful? Yep. Oh yeah. So, and you, especially taking that FD route. Cause like, I mean, you've heard it before. I preach nonstop. I hate seeing people go the FD route just because like, I know most people out there don't have what it takes to get through that. You're yeah. giving up 10 times more than what you're actually gaining <laughs> yeah. from it. So are you prepared to deal with that for 10, 15, 20 plus years before you actually start making a dime from all this shit? Yeah. It's it's nuts, but people don't, like they see all these higher level guys in FD 
And they're like, oh, he's making bank. He's like, he ain't making <laughs> shit from being yeah. there. What do you mean? All that money is getting dumped into being there. That's yeah. it. He's not drawing shit from it. His normal day job is what he's getting paid from. Yeah. He, he just loves the opportunity to have this shit. And he exactly. worked his ass off to do this inherently for free. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that. the FD anyway. route, on, I mean, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... I see FD for me is like, um, I don't really know how to say this in a way. It's like, so I don't, I don't drink. I don't do any, like anything. Yeah. I'm like a hundred percent like straight. FD is like my vice. I know it's not good for me. Mm. I know it's not healthy for me. Or it's like somebody that wants to do an ultra marathon. Yeah. Like yeah. running 250 that, miles. Dude. Like that's not actually it's healthy nuts. for you. You know what I mean? But you want to do it to prove that you can to yourself. Like mm -hmm. for me, the only, and I think it's important to like, to back up a little bit. I know a lot of guys that like get into drifting and are like, I want to do FD. Yeah. And I think that kills no. it. That kills. And if that's your goal, fine. But like that kills the joy for me when I, in 2017, when I like had my license locked up halfway through, like. I was definitely getting my license. I was still like, oh, I don't think I can do it. Like, yeah. I don't know if I want to do it. Mm -hmm. Because I was just so focused on the experience and just like loving drifting so much that it, that's where it took me. Yeah. I didn't start out in 2014 like, I'm going to be an FD driver. Mm -hmm. just, I just want to drive. I just want to drive. Somehow I ended up here. <laughs> this is so fun. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> I want to drive. This driving thing's fun. This driving thing's cool. Back when I started, like people didn't tandem as much. People weren't nearly as good as they are today as a whole. Um, so I was like, competition was really the only way to get that higher level of driving mm. that you can kind of see today at any yeah. event, anywhere. So I was like, all right, I want to do Pro-Am. Got into Pro-Am, like, this is fun. Because I was like, I remember doing like a Club Loose 2 event. I was like, hey, John, can we like put cones out so I can at least like practice putting my car in a specific spot? Because yeah. like just going around the track is kind of boring. And he's like, oh, we, you know, I don't want to like have to pick them up. And I'm like, okay, I respect that. But yeah. um, I wanted another challenge. So I was like, okay, let's get into F, you know, not FD, let's get into Pro-Am and see what we can do. And, you know, that was so exciting and so fun. But I yeah. never was looking at FD as the goal. FD was sort of like a aspirational goal. Mm -hmm. but it wasn't like something that I was betting on or planning on or even thinking I could do it. Yeah. It was still one of those things that you're like, I, that's not really that obtainable. Like you just yeah. can't picture it yeah. yourself in that situation. Exactly. Like, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it makes the journey so much more fun because you're not focused on the mm -hmm. result. You're just focused on that event that day that yeah. like, and it was so much fun. And so I basically just like popped my head. I was like, Oh, we're an FD now, you know, <laughs> that, my love of the game got me here. Yeah. Not the end game. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? And that was such a pure journey. Cause you'll see guys that like want to get into it. They'll build this crazy car. They'll do like a season or two of pro am not have success and like get burnt out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's cause you weren't doing it for the right reasons, bro. Yep. But like for me, even I don't think FD is healthy for me. I don't think it's good for me. I don't think it's the right thing for me to be yeah. doing <laughs> like straight up. Um, Everyone needs a little bit of bad in their life. Yeah. But like, and I don't, I don't think it's something I want to do for a long time. I don't want to do it for 20 years. I don't want to do it for, I don't want to do pro. Um, I don't so want you, it. You don't feel the need to step up into pro one. Whatsoever. No, no, I don't want to step up to pro. Um, I don't want to ever have it be my career. I don't want it to ever That's be something wild. I rely on to pay the bills. Like I'm so lucky to be oh, able to yeah, say no, like, definitely not. like yeah. FD is my so. hobby. Like yeah. that's kind of crazy to be able to say like FD is my hobby, but I always want to keep drifting a hobby. I never yeah. want it to be something. I I want to, I mean, I'm 30, like I'm almost 30. Like I want to be more normal. <laughs> I want to be like, cause I've devoted like literally like the last 10, 11 years of my life, every single thing I've done has gone into like progressing this goal of drifting. Yeah. And now it's like, I want to experience other things in the world. You know, I want to experience like, financial stability <laughs> and yeah, like yeah. um having like i really want to have a nice like garden at my house and like Dude, you know crazy to even think about <laughs> like i want to have like a sick yard yeah i want to have you know i want my driveway to be like no weeds in my driveway like yeah. that's what gets me excited now Damn. more so than like winning a battle <laughs> you know which is like crazy well let me ask you this then because i 
I asked this to Josiah. Um, what like what do you picture life after all of this? So formula drift and just drifting in general, because there comes a day for all of us, no matter what the circumstance is, like one day we're not going to be drifting again. We may still have some part in drifting, but like whether it's physical reasons or whatever, you're sick. Yeah. No. Like, yeah. I mean, for me, it's I see it as like I I want to focus on uh, a marriage, a family, kids yeah. like that's sort of the high level what I would want to focus on. And then below that, just what is my life like? I still always want to drift. Mm -hmm. Drifting, FD exists in this weird like world within drifting where it costs more than every other type of drifting. It takes way more time than every other type of drifting, but you get to drive less than every other type of drifting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's one of the biggest, the, the hardest- The whole way around, it doesn't make any fucking exactly. sense. Exactly, <laughs> like it makes no sense, but- that's the hardest thing for me with FD is I see all of these things I'm giving up mm -hmm. in drifting, outside of drifting. Like I don't do anything for myself. I don't do, I don't go on vacations. I don't buy, I don't got to eat. I don't do anything. I don't buy my, I, I haven't got a tattoo since 2019 because I, you know. Dude, don't, I feel you. Same here. Like I don't want to spend that money on something that's not a car related thing. Yeah. Specifically a drift, like an FD related thing. Like my house, like obviously I'm, thankful that i have like a house and like that's like the one financially responsible thing that i did but like <laughs> yeah <same here. laughs> like Fuck. there's more things i want to do to that but like i can't you know like i said i want to have a sick garden i can't like yeah. i can't spend any dime outside of fd and that after a while just kind of wears you down yeah um and it's easy to also say that in the off season like i'm sure if you asked me the same question in atlanta i'd be like i would do anything yeah, to be here <laughs> yeah but i also i think um I'll answer your question. What, what is it? What I want to do after drifting? I want to be, I would love to be a spotter for somebody. I would love to be a coach for somebody. I would love to be a mentor for all of ProSpec as a whole. Yeah. Um, I would love to um, continue to drive. I think Nate Hamilton is a great example of how to have like a great program after FD. Yeah. Um, and Which, I don't know. He might be bouncing back. Yeah. Maybe. Everybody wants to come back. They always, it's like X. They always <laughs> want to come back. Um, FD is that like toxic X that you just can't get away from um didn't build an 86 for nothing. <laughs> yeah exactly but um just enjoying like i haven't driven i've never driven us air i've never driven mid pond i've never driven that um new track that polecat track people are doing i've never yeah. driven the road course at e-town like i've never experienced a lot of the things that i wanted to experience in drifting because it doesn't advance my program so yeah. being able to sort of just I would love to build a car that's sort of like a go anywhere, do anything, still cheap to operate, like Chelsea Genova's Fox Body style car that's like still can go at any track you want, still cheap to operate, like yeah. that theory. And that just be like my only car for a while. I have plans for like this super cool build I would love to do in the future, but put up a pole barn. I've always wanted like a pole barn in a shop. Everyone's like, like my engine builder, he gave me my engine back this fall. And he's like, oh, this has to, like, you have a climate controlled shop, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I just have like my two car garage. And he's like, oh, well this, like, if you're not putting the engine back in the car, like it needs to be climate controlled. And I'm like, okay. So I like, stuck it in my kitchen through my back door. <laughs> um, but like, I, I would love to have like a proper uh, shop with like, yeah. maybe I've never worked on a lift in my life. I've always just jack sands. So, okay. Then why don't you chase that rather than the FD stuff? Like what, what, what's keeping you in FD compared to going down that? where you get to drive all those tracks that you've always wanted to, but doesn't line up with what your program is and all the people that you want to drive with or yeah. whatever the circumstance, the shop, like you, yeah. that's all of that stuff could easily, yeah, easily be, you could get the same funding for, for that. I guarantee you probably if not more for that to do content based around yeah. it instead of being an FD. So I think is that, that not, I think you're exactly right. You know, I, I think that there, I, you could make a case that I could have just mic dropped after last season, Chelsea Denofa style and been like, look, I came back. Yeah. Brand new car, brand new chassis, two podiums in a row, fifth place in the championship. That's good enough for me. Yeah. Like, and in hindsight being 2020, maybe that's what I should have done <laughs> because I, my only goal ever, like a more spiritual level goal was like, I want to prove to myself that I'm good at drifting. Yeah. Which is kind of silly because I feel like if you asked 
anybody else. I don't think it's silly. I just think the FD route is not the way to prove that. For me, that it was. Sense. So there's just this whole thing that I've been that I've been like talking to my counselor about. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel that. Yeah, like um, like why competition? Yeah. Why? Because for me, I've always competed in something. Like I grew up racing sailboats. Then I did like golf. Then remote control stuff. Yeah. Then okay, cars, and then okay, how can I compete with cars? Like, why does it have to be competition? Mm -hmm. And I think it stems like from a personal level of this. I don't feel like I'm good enough mindset that I've like always had in my life, which has served me in a lot of ways because it's sort of, it's pushed me to be successful in my career and successful in drifting and like yeah. But it's I could have achieved all of that same level of like success in a much healthier way, mm -hmm. approaching it from a, a mindset of like. I love doing this. Yeah. I love cybersecurity. I love drifting or like, I love drifting. I don't need to prove to myself that I'm better than these people to know that I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. But here we are, you know? So I think- Sometimes we're sick and fucking twisted. <laughs> yeah, like sometimes you just, that's why I'm saying like drift, FD is not healthy for me. Like yeah. for a lot of people, it might not matter, but like I care about it so much that it's it's definitely not healthy in, in like- yeah. uh you know, <laughs> mental way. <laughs> like it's so, there's not a day that goes by. I don't think about it. There's mm -hmm. not a, like, and the thing with FD is I say it's a lot like gambling. It's like yeah. the highs are so high and the lows are so low. Yeah. There's no, not really much middle ground in there. And I want my life to look more like, like if you think about like highs, lows, highs, lows, I want my life to be more like steady like think about yeah. when you go to a normal i don't want the 30 foot waves <laughs> yeah, yeah. i just want the little tiny crashers like when i go to a normal drift event or like a grassroots event with my g you wake up in the morning you're like i'm excited to go drifting today yeah you, you go to the track the oil, you just yeah. load the bitch you don't check tire press you just go out you go to the track you have fun all day yeah. and then you go home yeah. your state it's like this all day you're not oh, oh, oh you know like before I, every FD driver will probably tell us, like before qualifying, you're like, why do I do this to myself? This is the most like stupid thing. Why am I putting myself in this level of stress for yeah. no reason? And then you have like a great, so you're like really low, and then you have like a great run, and you're like screaming on the mic, everybody's so maybe stoked, I got my mojo back. and it's like <laughs> oh, super high, and it's like that's cool, but it's not. I don't think it's good for me. Maybe yeah, yeah. maybe other people don't experience those same levels of swings that I do, but like that's not like in a big picture long-term thing that's not healthy for me and i think i can enjoy drifting in a way like i outlined with a shop and a nice car that i can go anywhere with and drive all these tracks like i think i could have a ton of fun doing that if i just re and i'm working on like reframing it for me because what's also hard about drifting is like i said or fd is i put so much into this right so what does it mean about me as a person if i lose okay does that mean that my best, my all, everything I've done, these hours on the sim, hours building this car, doing all, does that mean like it's just not good enough? You know, that's how I see a losing an FD. Because how else could you, you know, like, and what extra stings is if you lose to somebody that you know doesn't put in as much as you. Yeah. Like, oh, is his 50% so you better you than You have a hard best? time with self-accountability. Like, you are really, really hard on yourself yeah. no matter what you do. I'm like, what is it? Like, I'm like, even as in into it like what does it mean to make a mistake in drifting like what does that mean about me as a person if i mess God, up this diagnosis run? yeah it's just like, security it you is. know what so i mean you definitely like, have big brain um so i think that for a lot of people they might not be that like crazy about it and yeah. for them it's just like oops i had a bad run like that sucks we'll go again i think another thing that sort of adds a layer to it i is, see ben hobson in that in that aspect yeah in, like chelsea de nofo where the like they're not even really there for the competition, but they keep winning just because nothing, it seems like nothing breaks them down in any yeah. way. As far as what you see from an outsider perspective. Yeah. I don't know what happens inside the trailer when they're pissed. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. they could be breaking everything in there, but yeah, like it's that seems to be the right approach you should have going into FD. And I know you said you want to go a little deeper on that and stuff too. So. Yeah, I mean, Definitely. we're kind of yeah, we're kind of doing that. And how like, I think Hobson's a great example of like how to have a great mindset. But also Hobson, like for him, he his life is drifting. Yeah. So F FD is a constant for him, which is great. Like I love I love Ben. He's an awesome driver. He's gonna kill it wherever he goes in pro. 
but like that was his goal is to go pro, you know, yeah. like, or these, these guys where they might have the budgets to be like, I can, I can be in prospect for 10 years, you know, that would take a lot of stress away. For me, I feel like there's this timer aspect where it's like, I got to be good right now. Cause I can't afford this for five years. That's a lot of my mindset too. Cause I, I, I do kind of associate what you're saying and the way you approach it a little bit more to me because i stress myself the fuck out <laughs> in so many ways that is not healthy whatsoever and it just half the time doesn't even make sense yeah but like i have to do that for myself to keep myself in check or else i will just wander and i like i swear to god i have adhd sometimes so like i'll fucking bounce all over the place and put my all my energy into the wrong basket and if i don't keep myself in check so i'm right there with you as yeah. far as that goes it's it's so hard to not be hard on yourself it's so hard to not like stress out about it when you because like for me if i care about something mm -hmm. then i get like that yeah like for example i was terrible in college like i was terrible and you would think looking at me it'd be like how could you possibly let yourself like fail classes yeah. knowing, you know, when I'm over here, like I made I, a mistake. I felt like I was wasting time, but I was like, that Which I didn't even go. Yeah, like, I, I felt like I was going to be wasting time for me. I'm like, all I care, I care about drifting so much. Like drifting was the priority. Number one, yeah. when I had time, that's when college got, you know, and I still made it through and everything worked out, whatever. It's a piece of paper that you need to do what you do, whatever for me, at least. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. but like, why don't I care about that? It's, you know, it's like, why, or why am I not like neurotic about that? It's because I don't care about it. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff that I care about that is like, there's no passion in it. Yeah. And I think a great example for me of like how to, what I want drifting to look like is skateboarding. Like I skate yeah. twice a week and I love it. I love skateboarding and I've never had a desire to compete. I've never had a desire to compare myself to other people in skateboarding. But I did have this sort of unhealthy habit of like, if I don't do like a sick trick today or learn yeah. this new trick, then the whole session was wasted. Mm -hmm. And my counselor, once again, was like, I need you to go to the skate park today and don't do any tricks. Just roll around. Are you insane? Just <laughs> like, just, I mean, I skate like mini ramps and like it's little mini bowl things. Like it's easier than just like, you know, but I was like, okay. So I just like rolled around and just like enjoyed the feeling of being on a skateboard. Yeah. And then I started to be kinder to myself in this later sessions and being like, okay, I'm not, I don't, doesn't matter why why does it matter if you yeah. land this hard trick and what that did is it made me have more fun skate better yeah. and i was ended up just doing those tr hard tricks because you're in you're approaching it from a better mindset mm -hmm. um oh yeah and now i like i love skating now more than i've ever loved skating and it's so i have this such a great healthy relationship with skating mm -hmm. and i feel like i have this unhealthy relationship with drifting and i would love to make drifting look more like skating like in the ways that I said, just do the events that I think are fun when I want to have a shop, you know, have a shop where I feel like I have space to do everything I want, where I have time to spend on a family, on my house, like on these other things to live a more like well-rounded life. Cause I, there's this like picture that I saw that I really resonated with me where it's like a balancing beam and that's your identity. Like your identity is this okay. beam and you need to support your identity with like different things. And if you just have one pillar of your identity, like for me, my identity is drifting. Yeah. Or like my pillar is drifting. So my identity is like really like unstable because <laughs> like my, you know, cause it, it relies only on this one thing. Yeah. If I have a great day drifting, I feel great. If I have a terrible day drifting, I feel not only I feel terrible. I'm more nervous about this year cause I have to like back up last year. You know what I mean? Last yeah, year there yeah, was like yeah. no expectations. It's like, okay, we like totaled the car in Atlanta. But we, I know we can do better. Mm -hmm. St. or Jersey was like, oh, we got knocked out in 32, but I know we can do better. We made a bunch of changes and then we got two podiums because the car is driving great. <laughs> you know? Well, now it's like, I have no excuse to be bad now. The car's yeah. dialed, the team's dialed. I got to be good. So that's be stressing me out more. But um, anyway, um, it's like, and now I need to remember what I was like, where I was going with this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because that is like a big thing that stressed me out with drifting. But it's like, how do I just make, long story short, I just need to make drifting more fun and more like enjoyable for me. Yeah. But I still, FD is still good to do. It's it's something I needed to do. I don't regret ever doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't regret any of the money I've spent, any of the, because you make so many great memories. And it does oh, also yeah, give I'm you sure. this level of credibility that's nice. Like, yeah. oh, this dude's like driving FD, like he, whatever. 
um, it helps you in other aspects and it helps you build like a network to then go out and do things like Nate Hamilton does where you can just make content and have fun. Yeah. Um, but oh, the identity pillars. Yeah. So like if I great, if I have a great day drifting, my identity, or it's like, a, I'm like, great. If I have a bad day drifting, it's like, oh man. Yeah. I see that as a reflection of my, who I am as a person. Mm, Whereas if you gotcha. have like other pillars, like say family or, um, other hobbies or like stability in general for me as a pillar and like pillars can have layers like financial stability stability at the house yeah um you know maybe like my drifting pillar is always going to be there because i love drifting i love autumn i just love drifting maybe the third pillar like i said is like family and stuff like that and then that helps your identity be more stable because if you have a bad day drifting you have these other things to support yeah. you so you're not like oh my entire my entire life <laughs> You know, I'm not going to be super bummed about drifting because, look, I have this amazing family and this yeah. really cool house to go home to or whatever. That's why I asked about kind of doing the more fun route of it and approaching it that way instead. Because, like, I would say it's never too late to ch just change that. Correct. Because then again, you would also get that uh, that's a lot of the time back, I would say. Yeah. Because what, what I found for myself was I was dedicating everything to drifting. And, like, it was consuming the fuck out of me. Because I was putting myself around a bunch of people also that were a lot more it, farther ahead than me in drifting. And I was trying to catch up and shit. And yeah. that's that's a bad way to approach it in general. But now the, the eggs have almost fallen in the basket of work is what that that pillar is for mm -hmm. me. So, like, my media company, this podcast, and, the dude, I dedicate an ungodly amount of time to this podcast, and drifting just gets put on the back burner. But it's also allowed me to have the feeling of drifting to where nothing really matters if something goes wrong. For example, I've never been able to go out and completely have a shit day driving and still go home with a smile on my face until now. So I had my first test day, went ungodly terrible. Like, went two gas stations beforehand. It's below 10 degrees. It had just got done snowing a couple days before. So everything's icy. 93 pumps, 92 pumps, whatever it was, wasn't working. So next gas station. Took 40 minutes to fill up the car <laughs> because it was just moving that slow. Get to the track, realize my key's missing. Let drop the key at the gas station. Had to go an hour and a half back to Dude. the gas station, get the key, come back to the track, made one lap. Car felt like shit. Came off, let some tire pressure out, made another lap. Power steering is still shit, so the car felt terrible. And I tapped a tire wall, and I was like, nope, I'm leaving. But at the end of it, I was like, you know what? I don't even really care. Like, nothing catastrophic happened, so yeah. we're good. The thing that's so frustrating with FD, I think, too, or just competition drifting in general is the effort you put in isn't really tied to the result in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, like the, the guys that win every event might not the be the ROI best guy that day. not visible whatsoever. And it's like if, like if I, I always use the same analogy, like if I want to run a 5K or if somebody wants to run a 5K, the amount of effort they put into training for that is probably going to show in how fast they run it Yeah, or how comfortable, yeah. you know, how the result is. Like in drifting, that's just not the case. Like I could put in all this work, I could do all this stuff, I could show up there and I could still get knocked out in the top 16. Yeah even though I put in 10 times more effort than anybody else there. Whereas if I you still have to rely on the car working, exactly so like factor car that. working. How are you feeling that day? My, is it maybe raining? Like whatever. Yeah. Um, but with other forms of F of drifting outside of FD, like I feel like there is a more direct correlation. Like if I wanted to make content related to drifting, mm. the outcome of that content would probably be more directly tied to, how much effort did I put into it? Yeah. You know? Which uh, I would say is probably your best con. That's what most people want to see anyways. Yeah. Nobody could give a flying fuck. <laughs> Watch you drive. Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> Nobody and I, cares about that really. Yeah. Like I've been doing it a while and I've been, I build on my own cars and I'm technical. So I feel like I could talk to people about things that are interesting in a way that yeah, they would yeah. watch. Um, so I, I definitely would want to do that outside after FD whenever that is. But yeah, I think the other hard the hard thing for me is I don't care about like optimizing my growth. Like I'm not going to post something that I don't want to post because it's trending. 
Oh, I would, I would never. You know what I mean, or like whatever, or like how everybody's like throwing like slup, whatever, like slushies at their pickup trucks on TikTok now. Yeah, stupid as shit. It's like I would never go out and do that to get the water bottle one back in the day was fine. (laughs) That was kind of cool because I was like, it's a water bottle. It's not really gonna do anything. Yeah. So like, I would, I would never be like, oh, this is really popular right now. I'm gonna go make a reel about it to try to get followers. So I'm just like, I'm gonna do what I would do every day, share it. And if somebody likes that, then that's sick. Yeah, that's um, the proper approach for longevity purposes. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing it just for short term, quick views, like yeah, go do this stupid, like whatever clickbait shit. But uh, yeah, doing it for longevity and like having a true audience that actually gives a shit. Yeah, you just yeah. put what you want, and whoever watches it, they'll watch it. Yeah, that's that's definitely the the strategy going forward. It's just like. Film what I want to film, you know, film my life to a point where it's not disruptive. Yeah. Share it. People like it. They like it. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on that you mentioned a little bit is like about like this is why, like you say, I harp on people not taking the FD route. Yeah. And this is also like when people I see you ask a lot of people like, well, what are, what's your advice to people getting into drifting or what's your advice for like newbies? Like for me, I think that. We'll save that. Save that part. Okay. We'll we'll save that for the end. On a high level, that's for every single one. On a high level. Well, maybe we should save it till the end though, because I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> what I'm about to say covers that too. Because what I'm gonna what I'm gonna say is like, and you know, this doesn't have to stay in if we want to save it to the end. But what I'm gonna say is like, I my thing is I wouldn't tell somebody what to do, because I think making the mistakes is part of the journey, and if you babysat somebody into having the most perfect drifting journey they wouldn't appreciate it as much because they wouldn't have to go through the bullshit that we all have yeah. to go through so like if somebody's like you know if you like, don't ls swap your car don't ls swap your car and they do it and they have a terrible time with it and then they like have to you know mess with it it's like dude you could have gotten so much seat time if you left like this vq in it or whatever mm-hmm. my argument is like those are both equally valid paths and him yeah. and that person making those mistakes and maybe getting less seat time at the end of the day that's part of their journey and that journey is oh, no, like yeah. super Dude, like okay that's perfect that you said that because i made a reel about that the other day about ls swaps like you don't need a fucking ls swap your after your first season of drifting you don't and i literally put in the description like if you have the money and the want to by all means do it like i will never tell someone don't build what you want but I'm speaking to the very low budget guys that will do anything to get into the sport. Like they just oh, yeah. want to make yeah. it happen. I'm like, well, be smart about it if you're doing it. So yeah. like if you have a, a 350Z and you just got done with your first year, there's no way in hell that you have maxed out your capability on that car. Correct. I agree with Drive that. again on that platform one more, that. just one more year, half a season, one more half season and then do the swap. Like, if you're that low budget, that's the only thing that I meant by that real. So I, I 100% agree with you. Like, if you've got the means to, build whatever you want because that's exactly what's going to keep you in drifting. Yeah, or people that are if like... you're cool with the the issues, by all means, do it. Yeah, like... Yeah, like, what? I think that even if in the moment somebody's like, this sucks, I really shouldn't have done this. Like, I should have listened to you. But, yeah. like that is what makes it better like i don't think that if i came into fd in 2018 and just won everything yeah that it would that these podiums that i got last year wouldn't mean, would mean as much like when i got that first one in in st louis it was like 10 years of this like pent up not like i said earlier that's like not like that was the goal but it was always like aspirational. Yeah, yeah. like, man i would love to have a podium fd and like thinking about it especially once i'm in fd it's like well you're here you might as well try to get a podium so like <laughs> Thinking about that since 2018 when I first started it, like all of those, like that, like emotion was like crazy. Like I just like cried for like 10 minutes straight. I couldn't even get out of the car. I was like, I wish there were people in, like, I wish I had a camera guy in the pits, like capture that moment. I was just like, it was like crazy. And I'm like, I wish everybody could feel that because it was such an indescribable feeling. And it's like, that made everything worth it. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so then, many people long for that. Thing. Yeah, it's like, dude, to to focus because I feel like for me it was easy to focus on drifting for ten years for drifting to be my everything, like because yeah. I just love it so much. But I feel like a lot of people nowadays ten years is not a long time. Exactly. If you really think about it. Correct, and it's like a lot of people they get burnt out quick or they get they get you know distracted or they whatever. 
I'm like, man, to be able to like stay like pedal, like figuratively, like full throttle for 10 years plus with, you know, all this to be able to actually like achieve what I wanted to achieve out of it. I don't care if it's a third place. Like yeah. to me, that was, I won, yeah. you know, like I don't care. Like I won that. <laughs> and, um, I'm still standing on the box. Yeah. Bitch. Yeah. Like, you know, it's that meme where the guy's like in third place and like freaking out. And then it's like, yeah, that was like way more excited. Yeah. That's me. Like, I don't yeah. care. Like, so what? Two people did better than me. There's like 40 drivers there. Yeah. Like I'll take third. And like that feeling was so amazing. Um, to be able to like work for that for a long time and go through all of those trials and tribulations, even the beginning of the season with the wreck in Atlanta, not doing well in Jersey, like to come back and she'd be like, okay, yeah. finally, I had never won a battle in FD in 20. I had won battles, but they were never like heads up wins. Like yeah. in back in the day, I was like, oh, this guy had, had like a mechanical or, oh, we went one more time and then he broke or something like, yeah, which you could still argue like those are wins reason. because your car outlasted his or whatever. But like, it doesn't suit the satisfaction. Yeah, I never had like a heads up win. battle. I was like, am I ever going to win an FD battle? And this is like yeah. last year in like June. And then I go to Jersey and it's like, or we go to St. Louis. It's like win, win, win. Like winning battles against like good drivers. Like, okay, okay. And then go to uh, Utah and like, okay, Nate Chen in, for, in top 32. Like dude's yep. fifth in points right now. He's a dog. Like, okay, <laughs> got to get through him. Blah, blah, blah. Dustin Miles rematch. Like I had to earn those ones and it felt so rewarding. But it's like that could have been enough, <laughs> probably yeah, yeah, for me. Yeah. But you can't just do it one. You can't come back, put all that time and money and effort into it, do just one year, because like the majority of the money spent is on the car, not the season. So it's like, yeah, and you're the season is still incredibly getting expensive. Getting your feet but, wet again. Yeah, it's like okay. Anyways, so. imagine what we can do now. All these guys moved up. We have all this experience now. We could probably, you know, yeah. hopefully do pretty good. But anyway. That's my theory on like drifting in general is like people making like all the mistakes that I made, all the stuff I did that was stupid. Like I built this car in 2020 after I stopped FD because I like thought that it's what I needed to do to prove to people I could build like a low car that was cool, mm -hmm. that was stylish because like where I'm from, that's like a really big, I mean, it's obviously all drifting, like drift Indian where I come from is like they really, really harp on that. And I was like, I got to prove that I can do it because I've always been like the comp guy, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I just hated it because I was like, <laughs> Bumpers falling off, fucking miserable. <laughs> bumper, you know, got to take the bumper off to put it in the trailer. You, yeah, you know, drop half a tire and your rear bumper is in forty pieces. It's a good, a good line that yeah. you you have to balance on between yeah. style and functionality, and that's where I like to stay. I'm not yeah. one of those guys that's full style. It's like it has to be this specific kit or like fuck, I ah, fuck that. Yeah, it's like for me, we need the world, baby. Yeah, what what makes <laughs> drifting like? what takes as much hassle out of drifting for me? Yeah. Just like being able to put my car in the trailer without having to take body panels off. That's like a huge thing for me. Being able to put a <laughs> jack under it without having to put it up on like little ramps. Mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah. I will sacrifice that. I will sacrifice style for those things all day long because for me, that's what I really enjoy. Like that is what makes drifting enjoyable for me is being able to just focus on the driving and having fun. Obviously my car is not going to look like a freaking monster truck with whack fitment and ugly stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> but like you need to figure out what's important to you. And that's another thing in drifting that I think is really important is like so many people, there's like a couple people that have really loud voices mm -hmm. that people respect and they sort of like dictate what's cool. And if you don't fit in that box, you're not cool. So people might do stuff that they don't like or doesn't align with their interests mm -hmm. because they want to feel like they're fitting in or they have to do this to be cool and drifting. Yeah. And I think that it's like, that is the biggest gripe that I have with like grassroots drifting or like these smaller communities is people are so like clicky, not clicky, like that's not the case, but like if you don't have this style or yeah. a stylish car in general, like you can't sit with us type energy. And it's like, why can't we just let everybody have fun and drifting? Obviously you need to police like showing up with like, you know, the people that have like the cars, like, okay, dude, come on. Like you, you, it's not going to take you any more money or effort to make that thing look decent. Like, Oh yeah. <laughs> there's, there's like a threshold of like minimum threshold of like your car has to look p presentable, put together. But like if somebody, there's also like people really hate on like people that are new, which I think is crazy. Like not knowing something is seen as like, Bad. yeah i've never understood that part um, either which i don't get we don't get a lot of that around here i don't see too much of it but i have seen it before and it's that's pretty nuts to me 
that's why and that's like, why, why don't you want more people in drifting go help the motherfucker instead exactly of like, like what, what's the point why are you wasting your breath in general and that's why i love that's the one thing i do there's a lot of stuff i do love about fd and a, lo a lot of that is the drivers and everybody is like yeah they've all been through some shit they've all made mistakes they all have had whatever caught like they were all like these guys that like nobody it's how like you know you know how people it's like the vet, and I, you know, the veteran that's like real quiet and like doesn't talk about his service is probably like the dude that's like done the most crazy shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And these guys that have like, you know, never been overseas are like mm -hmm. acting like they're crazy. I feel like there's a obviously like mad respect to anybody in the armed forces in any capacity, but like that's just the nearest like example i can draw is oh like, no i i um, i'm with you on that my uncle was special forces he can't hardly talk about any anything but i know i know one that oh i don't know if i could say that I can't, <laughs> let's not say that um but yeah dude like it, that's that's exactly correct like these dudes these... like we've seen all the shit we've been through all the shit and we're not it's not a dick swinging contest in fd for real like we're just there to drive and try to do our best and everybody's like gives a shit yeah in grassroots that's like my there's like these guys that think they're cool or did something cool a long time ago or whatever and it's like once yeah it's like why don't you just let people live yeah why don't we try to bring as many people into driving as we can be respectful to them treat them like human beings like this is drifting dude mm -hmm. like nobody's gonna die if drifting goes away tomorrow yeah like it's not that serious i get that you've i get that like for example drift indie street league mm -hmm. that's an application-based process you better come correct yeah and if your car is ugly and you don't get in that's not their fault because they told you what they wanted yeah um but like if somebody shows up to a drift event it's like their first event or their second event or their whatever event and their car is ugly and like i feel like there you could approach people could be approached in a much more nice way also something that i think is interesting in drifting is people dislike things that they can't have instead of actually having the mental like yeah. the emotional intelligence to ask why they don't like something like there's this huge like movement of like oh if you trailer your drift car somewhere you suck and it's like okay maybe if we look at the people that are saying that they can't afford a truck and a trailer so ding 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 instead of them being like man i'm just not in a place in my life right now where i can afford a truck or trailer but it'd be really convenient to be able to have that yeah. They're like, oh, I need to dislike that. Because if I think to that's bad. It to that's yeah, the only and it's reason. Like, it's so fucking yeah, dumb, It's like, bro. dude, people like that's the one like that kind of stuff in drifting, just the lack of emotional intelligence in drifting is crazy to me. Like the people out here, like people are just very rude. People can be. Yeah. Drifting as a whole is the most like yeah. welcoming, amazing, like best community ever. But there's just like these people that I'm like, dude. And I feel like they always get the platforms. And it's like, why? Like, why mm. does this negativity get, like, get respected? Is it because you're like... Well, that's... I, we're all fucking short-winded, short attention span and shit. So the, the more emotion you can spark out of someone, the more reaction and viewership you're going to get out of them, which is, fucking sucks. But <laughs> yeah. we're all, especially women, are addicted <laughs> to drama and fucking negativity and shit it's nuts yeah like the drama in drifting is so the true crime shit y'all gotta so, cut that fucking shit out it's so draining to me like i don't want to hear about who is talking to who or who's doing what with who or yeah, this person did that ain't a gossip sport, bro. i'm Take like that shit somewhere else <laughs> i'm like dude i'm here to drive and go home yeah like uh and i i really don't like that side of it which you know you can avoid that yeah pretty easily but um no i think that drifting is there's definitely some interesting like just the whole I've, I've been thinking a lot about the whole like telling people what to do and or like if somebody asks me for advice directly mm -hmm. i'll give it to them yeah um but if they don't follow it and they still make the mistake yeah what's the most common one you get that they don't follow oh i don't know like just keeping cars simple that's fair but it's like i was in those same shoes and i'm i almost swapped my car the my second year it's hard man you like know? especially with companies like injuku selling so many different parts for each individual chassis or motor or 
this specific swap or whatever. Like it's hard to do research sometimes to figure out what part you should go with and like stuff like that. So I do understand the misconnection between it um, and how you can overwhelmingly make the wrong choice. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, for me though, it's like if I didn't make those bad choices initially, I wouldn't appreciate like my G37 so much. Yeah. You know, which like I love that car because it's, bone stock besides you know the most basic stuff and i have the ac on and the windows up and they're tinted so nobody can see me and there i can just <laughs> not have to be bothered and i could do like 100 laps weekend but i wouldn't appreciate that if that was my first if that was my normal yeah yeah you know i have yeah. to go through the cars that are hot and loud and i have an open trailer and it's raining on the way home and i'm mm. stressed about you know like all that stuff that you have to go through makes that like the maturation of somebody in drifting, like more special, I think. So you're like, yeah. I've kind of been through it. Even down to like the cheesiest of sayings, the the harder shit you go through, the better of a person it makes you or whatever the fucking saying is. I mean, it's true. It's like, it sounds so dumb and it's honestly quite annoying to hear. But like, if you actually think about it, it's very true. Yeah. Like half the shit that I know and how I make things efficient is because I have spent my time fucking it up multiple yeah, times. Exactly. There's something about because you could tell me all day like this is bad. Don't do this. It's going to fuck you up this way or whatever the circumstance is. And I'm like, but I'm curious. Like, exactly. I need to know for myself. I'm a visual learner. Like I have to physically be doing something mm-hmm. in order to comprehend what's going to happen. Yeah. So a lot of the times, even though I know I'm making the wrong decision, I'll still do it anyways, just so I can learn what it is. Yeah. Unless it's like life threatening. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'll think about that one. But like, I even did it with this with the new car. Like, I never had a Jay Z before. I could have probably just stuck like a big LS with nitrous in there. Yeah. And been fine. You know, had somebody make me headers and whatever. But like, I wanted. I was like, I could do the it was kind of not like me and it it turned out well but i was like i could do the most practical well documented thing that i know best because i know ls is like the back of my hand i know nothing about jay-z's but i was like i just want to do this for the experience and to like prove to myself it's not the most practical thing valve covers for this damn thing cost a thousand dollars like you know what i mean this oil pan from a junkyard costs six like i'm like this doesn't make a ton of sense yeah but i need to experience it and i want to do this car my way because i want to ex- i want to be able to say i did it because if i did the route that made more sense like every single car in prospect is a blown v8 yeah like, yeah for the most part like they just all are and i just wanted to do it which my last car was a blown v8 and the, you know i it wanted works. to do it different I mean, and i wanted to do it my way because i wanted to have success on my terms because i yeah. wanted to I, would, I thought that would feel even better and there were trials and tribulations with that you know, blew up the motor like first day out, had to, you know, all this stuff. But I learned and we learned from it. And I'm like, I'm so glad I did that yeah. because it's sick. And I'm having success with somewhat of a non standard. Obviously, James Dean winning three championships in a row or two championships in a row with Jay Z. Like, obviously, it's a sick motor. But like, for me, and if you look at your competitors, it's like, this is cool. We did something a little different that I did my way. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. So, like, that's rewarding. When you come, you know, even though somebody might be screaming, don't do it, like this makes more sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I do get it from like our side too, where we've been through it, we've seen all these, we've made the mistakes ourselves. And you're like, don't make this mistake because I remember how that felt when I made that. So I'm yeah. trying as a friend to prevent you from doing that. But they, that person doesn't know yet. And like <laughs> that act of fucking around and finding out, as it were, is like, valuable i think for yeah. people in in terms of like growth in life hell yeah so well let me let me kind of twist back to something um from when you said that you wanted to talk to ryan sage about possibly having that intermediate guy that kind of coaches the new people through what all needs to be done now referencing from the conversation we just had do you think it will fully be effective even though there are pe- going to be people like me that like, no matter how many times you tell me, like I'm going to have to find out for myself. So, so like, will it really balance it out enough? Do you think? I think that there's some things that are pretty black and white. Like, Hey, wear your suit to the meeting. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, stuff like that. Make That's... sure your team's professional. Yeah. This is how parking's going to work. This is how 
these are my recommendations for gearing and why this is my recommendation for how to attack this track and why mm -hmm. um and i think those a lot of the guys that are in fd even if they've only been driving for a few years have matured quickly to the point where they're like maybe more open to feedback um criticism. Can, yeah or yeah. just like guidance because i i wouldn't want to be like you have to do this i was just like hey this is my recommendation if you yeah i'll give it to every single person here based on my experience but if you choose to listen to that that's on you but i think a lot of the so stuff is much more sense. yeah it's like, a lot of common sense be. stuff it's like a lot more anymore. like cut and dry like who wouldn't want to take your advice on where to start on gearing yeah you know like who wouldn't want to take your advice on like, hey, if you go a little bit track left here, it's easier to get close to them here. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's pretty cut and dry. If I was like, okay, you need to build this pro spec car that looks exactly like this with these parts, then people might be like, no. Uh, no. Because <laughs> a lot of people bring in their own experiences and what they're familiar with and comfortable with yeah. and stuff into that kind of stuff, which is really important to have a car that you're, you know, that you know well. But mm -hmm. um I would like to try it. You know, I haven't talked to Ryan about it yet, but I would love to to have that conversation and be like, hey, you don't have to pay me. I don't want anything out of it besides just the love of this sport and these guys. Like, I still love FD. Like, I would love, I had a call with him and I, when before they announced the new judges and I was like, dude, if I could be a judge, mm. I would drop FD tomorrow to judge FD. You know, <laughs> like I would love to be involved in it and sick. give back to it in a way that, I think I would get 10 times more enjoyment. Like Chad, my buddy with that um, E46 yeah. that I was talking about earlier, he told me, I was like, hey, do you want to do it again this year? Like crew for me? And he was like, dude, the rounds that I crewed for you was the most fun I had out of any of the events that he did all season driving. That's awesome. And I think that that really gets back to the point or like to the theory that helping other people and doing stuff for other people will give you more enjoyment and happiness yeah. than doing stuff for yourself, even though it's important to I'm do sure things for yourself. I'm sure you just improved his program tremendously just by that simple fact yeah. as well, too. And like to hear he's like, man, this is the most fun I had. I was like, that's awesome. But I think I could take that and exp you know basically apply that to my life. I'm like, okay, yeah. I've done FD. I've done what I need. I've got the trophies. Like nobody can take this away from me. Now how can I give back and make? Like I would love to spot for like a really competitive dude. Yeah, and be like, all right, like let's go out and win a championship together, and like have this great relationship, and let me help you, like, be the. Some of those guys best. are watching, so <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> hit me up. But or like, even something I really wanted to do for a long time is, I have my car, I have my truck, I have my trailer. Pick somebody, Jacob Anderson, um, mm -hmm. Harrison Johnson from Texas. Yep, those guys that are absolute dogs like but they might not have the the funding or whatever to go out and buy a truck that can go out of these rounds yeah. buy build the car be like just get enough money to be able to drive mine you know like i'm not trying to make a ton of money off you i just want to give you the platform to go show how good you are if you want to huh. you know that's cool like i've already got all the expensive stuff i'm gonna lose my ass if i sell this car anyway so why don't I get use it to give somebody that I know would be amazing wow, an opportunity? Wow, that's cool. Um, and I've thought about that a lot. Like, I don't want to be not like these arrive and drive programs where it's fifteen thousand around and all this stuff. Like, oh yeah, that, just make it to where right. I'm not spending my money. Yeah, and I'll give you all the tools, and I'll come with you, and Brian will come with me, and and we'll I'll spot for you or whatever, and Brian can be your crew yeah. chief, and we can, you know, give you that opportunity to to be great. And I think that would be really rewarding too, is being able to see somebody like, I would love nothing more than to see somebody like go kick ass in my car. Yeah. <laughs> like that would be so Literally, cool. Literally, yeah. That somebody that would never have had the opportunity to do that, you know, without that. Dude. Why? I, okay, so that's, that's actually something good to touch on. Why isn't that more common, I would say? Because like, obviously you got the teams, you got RTR, you got OD, you got... You know, all of these teams where they do recruit drivers, but it's on such a large scale that it doesn't really seem obtainable. Yeah, I mean, it's but expensive. But that, like, uh, I think, honestly, now that you say that, I think we're going to start seeing that more as a lot of these older guys in FD and Pro 1 start retiring. I think they're going to, what are they going to do with the car? It's just going to sit there, unless it's a car that they're already driving someone else's or whatever, yeah. but, you know. I think that is something that will become more popular. I think it's hard, like for Odie, for example. 
Odie is so good that he can charge a premium. Oh yeah. You know, because yeah. you're pay- like Forsberg. Forsberg is so good that he can charge a premium because obviously like, you're paying for that experience. You're paying for the, the setup, the notes, the data. Yeah. You're paying for all that. That makes sense. Like I feel like there's this visible proof. You could go back through years and yeah, years of they've footage got credentials. To realize how well that car is put together. Yeah. So like Odie could quit tomorrow. I feel like if Odie wins a championship, he'll probably be done. But like say Odie does that does happen and he has a car open. Mm-hmm. He'll, there'll be somebody that's willing to pay oh, yeah. whatever he asks. So I think that it's more like for me, it would be more like a, I don't want to say like a charity thing, but like I don't care about making money off this. Odie, his whole life is yeah. as I would should. just say at least have a business around it. That way it's a marketing type yeah, deal. For sure. You could be the presenting sponsor of the vehicle Yeah, no matter who drives it and all that. Yeah, like I would love to explore that. Like, hey, um, yeah, like, hey, Jacob Anderson because he's good friends with CMJ. He's my spotter. Like, hey, let's, and I haven't talked about this to him at all, but or CMJ, but I've been thinking about it. Like, hey, you, I'm sure you could petition in. He's, you're an absolute beast. Let's go drive. And maybe he wouldn't even want to. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, I know Harrison would be another guy that's like, he's got his license like 15 times. Like, he's just like so good. And he could be an absolute killer in FD. And I'm sure there's tons of other people out there that are like, they always say, I'm sure the best soccer player is some kid that never got the opportunity. Yeah. And I would love to be able to sort of have this unique program that is like able to give people those opportunities where, yeah, yeah, I'm not making money, Which but isn't whatever. It, it's crazy to me because the, the guys that you're talking about, like they have the ability to go get that money. Dude, it's hard. If it's I so like, hard. I know it's hard, but like, especially if you've proven that you, you could, you've gotten your license 10, 15 different times. <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, that's plenty of proof to almost any company out there that you would do some damage if you had a weapon of a car. So, like, as much as that seems like a charity aspect, it's really not because those same people could go and get the sponsorship. They're just not putting in that type of work to that reward i i would Dude, say it's so hard to get like i guarantee like, if you asked everybody in f in prospect how much money are you getting on average it's probably like five grand no like shit. straight up like straight yeah. up i know i'm not gonna say who one of the very top guys in prospect with one of the best programs only got 20 i knew grand. it was low but i didn't expect that fucking like low. god damn one of the best guys with the best programs only got 20 grand last year wow like total i got like five grand. Mm-hmm. Um, like my back half of my season. I mean, well, in specifically monetary though. Yeah, right? yeah, monetary. Which that's like really you're still getting help with parts and all that. Yeah, shit I mean, too, any so. company will throw parts at you, like for the most part. Yeah, but, they um, have way more to work with that way. It's a, like that doesn't really matter. Like that doesn't pay the bills, and it's so no. hard to get a company to want to give you money. Mm-hmm. Um. Like, like me and my buddy Ben this year have been absolutely busting our ass, like being yeah. students of the game, going to SEMA, PRI, working primarily outside of the automotive industry to try to find yeah. partners that want to fund you mon- like with some money. And it's so hard. Like it is 10 times harder than drifting, 10 times harder than, it's like dating. Yeah, It's like, you got to get these companies interested in you when there's like a million other people interested in them. And then you have to get them on a date as quickly as possible. Like I'm always like, let's set up a phone call like right yeah, now. Yeah. And then you have to like explain, you have to, un- they have to be compatible with you, right? Like you can't, not every company is going to be a fit for what you can offer them. So you have to figure out if you guys are even compatible, you know? Oh yeah. Does that company love dogs and you like cats? You know, yeah. like. Not saying it goes that bare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 but like, you know, no, no. Are, they, are their goals with their marketing budget this? And can I help them accomplish it? Like, That's usually the first thing that I want. I'm myself trying to figure out. Exactly. Because I don't like, not to be like rude or anything, but like, I don't want to waste my time Correct. and I don't want to waste your time exactly. as well. So like, this is this is what I'm doing. What is your goal as far as marketing goes this year? And how can what I'm doing help you reach that goal. Yeah. As simple as that. Because that's all anyone really gives a fuck about. Exactly. How is the ROI going to be when all of this is said and done? You're basically a freelance marketing contractor for these people. Freelance salesman. Yeah. Like, you're not... That's why I think, like I said earlier, like, oh, you shouldn't have a packet. 
I think that the oh yeah, we didn't touch on the that. Tr- the traditional concept of I'm gonna have a packet, and at the end of it, it's gonna have like the gold, silver, and bronze tier, and each tier is gonna get you different things. And if you're a gold tier, you have a big sticker. And if you're a bronze tier, you have a small sticker. And I might, if you're gold, I'll put you on my t-shirt. It's like, that's so outdated for me. Like in my opinion, from all the stuff I've learned None this year, it's anymore, like, you yeah. you need to come to a company like we, like we just talked about and be like, okay, at a high level, what are your goals? Mm-hmm. And then how can I help you accomplish that? And you need to figure that out in a collaborative way, not a prescriptive way of like, this is what I can do depending on how much money you give me because somebody might not care about whatever. Like I talked to a company that I came into this pitch really like heavy on, here's what we can do like digital media for you. Yeah. They didn't care at all about that. They cared about how big's my sticker. What's, That's really odd. Which is weird, too. right? What's my pit space look like? Or like, what is, what is my presence in your pit look like? They didn't care That's at all. a little bit more normal. Whereas if I would have been like, hey, what are your goals before we had this meeting? Like, hey, what are your goals? How can we help you accomplish them? I would have been able to come in with a proposal. Yeah. Like, that's my theory. Like, this is the, this might be a secret. This might be like absolutely just throwing you guys completely through a loop. <laughs> I, I, I can't say. Well, that's what this is but for. Like, so they can get all the opinions they, they can get. My opinion is the best way to approach decision. a partnership is to get, a contact there ideally get an introduction from somebody if you can get an introduction from somebody that's huge and then be like hey don't even don't toss them a packet that's seven pages long that tells them your whole life story like nobody cares dude straight up nobody cares and then be Short, sweet to the point don't even give them anything say hey um i do this i think that you know my uh, my audience and your audience overlap i'd love to help understand your marketing goals can we have a meeting it can be like a three sentence email then they're like, sure, put 30 minutes on their calendar. And then in that first meeting, you're like, hey, this is kind of like a quick spiel about what we do at a high level. FD publishes their own packets, by the way, that we can use. So you can hit them with all the FD data and demographic information. And then if they care, yeah, yeah. and then be like, basically just, I'm like, we have a very engaged, educated, young audience that's not really a fan of anything else. Mm-hmm. And they love to spend money with the brands that partner with. FD drivers. And then, okay, they're interested now. And there's like, well, how can we, what does that actually look like? And they're like, oh, well, what we're trying to really push is we're releasing this new product. Okay. Or, oh, we're, tr- we've been like with a one manufacturer that I'm working with this year. They're like, well, there's these knockoffs that are coming on the market and mm-hmm. we want to prove that it actually makes more sense to buy genuine yeah. because it's more reliable. So we want you to push that and we want to use a lot of the data you've collected over last year because i used to run the knockoff part to show our audience that wow having it on a having your sticker on a t-shirt they don't care yeah (laughs) you know so understanding what they're interested in okay so you're interested in that great let's have another meeting next week and then you can talk about deliverables and then or you can talk about and then this meeting you could bring a proposal a packet and a proposal are two different things yeah this proposal doesn't need to be like when you think of a packet, like a all stylized with, mm-hmm. you know, action shots and stuff. It can be like, this is what, based off of our first conversation, this is what we think we can do for you. Yeah. And this is the dollar amount that we're assigning to that amount of work. Yeah. And then that company can say, looks great, or let's make some revisions and let's collaborate. And then, great, you have a set of deliverables. And I, I want to preface, like, you're not doing just a proposal. You're also prefacing to them that, like, you're dedicating t- time specifically for their brand. Yeah. Because you spent the time making a proposal only for them. Yeah. Not just sending the generic deck and all that stuff. That's why, for me, I like doing videos in that yeah. sense and not just, like, a written proposal thing, but... Um, there's some companies that I, I've done specific proposals for some companies. It wasn't fully necessary because I already had a relationship yeah. with whoever it was or whatever, but that's, that's huge. Like getting like, no, I feel like people really underestimate the value of just getting on a call with these people. Yeah. The, your I, first email yeah. tactic where just keep it short and like you're barely saying anything. Yeah. I, I say that a lot because most of the time you can't find the contact for marketing. Exactly. So you have to go through the regular email or regular customer service and God knows you don't want to tell that motherfucker what you're doing. Yeah. Because they're just a middleman. They don't care anyway. So you just literally just say, Hey, 
my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm looking to get in touch with marketing. What is mm -hmm. the best way to do so? That's yeah. it. And then they're just going to email you back their email or phone number or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Like people are out here sending these like full length proposals to like customer service. Customer reps, service. And it's like, like, come on. What? Nobody, I think the proposal, like the packet is potentially a thing of the past. Um, in my opinion, based off what I've had success with recently and just approaching these people. I like, wouldn't say it's fully a thing in the past. I would say it's it's more or less good to like keep all of your links and hyperlinks in one place to so where everything's easily clickable. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So and then your actual proposal goes along with it. So it's like kind of a side item. So almost. like the way I think of a packet is my likelihood of getting a call with a potential partner is the sending a packet with that initial email no matter how verbose or terse it is yeah um i don't think that the probability of getting a call with them goes up a ton whether you have a packet or not initially yeah. initially yeah. because they're like who the heck is this like i don't you know i, mean, I don't know who this person is i don't know what they're about so Especially a lot of the stuff solely a driver like yeah. there's nothing else to it a lot of the stuff you're going to put in a packet isn't relevant to them yet yeah. That's like skipping a step. And then the people make another mistake where they try to put like the tiers in that same packet. And you're trying to do like this whole sales process in one email when this person doesn't even know who you are. And it's like, that's a huge mistake. You need to break, you need to slow it down. Yeah. Make, make small bite-sized steps and progress this process along. And even after doing all of that with so many companies sending out hundreds of email, hundreds of emails, going on LinkedIn and like hitting up people on LinkedIn that are a part of companies. Like it's been so hard for us to get money. We've had yeses that then turn into no's. We've had yeah. like drawn out maybes. We've had all of these things. Oh, I'm still waiting on the budget. Yeah. Still and it's like, budget. it's just Which so is true most of the time. But. So, so, so hard. And like, I, it's not like everybody in prospect is getting 50 grand a year. I feel like yeah, nobody's yeah. getting 50 grand. I, if somebody yeah, is, I DM wouldn't me. I see pro anyone in prospect getting um, money. You know? you know, it's like, it's so hard. So, um, yeah, like that's, I think, the, like I said, if, if I picked like an average amount of funding that each driver has, I mean, I'd say if you looked at it, like the average might be 5,000. Yeah. But I think what it would look like if you actually looked at the data, it would be like 80% of the field is zero. <laughs> and then 20% is like, getting the money anyway yeah yeah yeah. um getting the whole all of it <laughs> yeah like so the average might even paint a different picture because i didn't get a single dime until last year yeah um and that's another thing ft doesn't nobody tells you how to do this nobody tells you how to do this and a lot of people that are at the top level are also out of touch with how it works in the trenches that we're in yeah like it's a lot easier to get partnerships when you're a well-established pro driver that's been doing it for 10 years. You, like, it just yeah, is. You made a name for yourself. Yeah, you like, have to prove. You basically have to show to these people that you're worth enough money, like you're worth a certain amount of money, and it, it has to make it worth it for them. And it, that's just a really tough thing to do. Like, yeah. It's just an incredibly, incredibly tough thing to do. And If you've ever had a weird thought of like, if it was life or death situation and someone had to buy my life, how much would it be worth? That's kind of what it feels like. Yeah. It's hard. That's hard to put a fucking number on. And it's yeah. hard to even think about. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to quantify or to try to quantify the value of your work for people yeah. and mm -hmm. also making sure that you're not over committing yourself and making these huge deliverable lists to try to sell a sponsor just because you want some money. Oh, or yeah, like, that's a big problem. I think it also dilutes. There's some situations that dilute our value, especially within the... That's why I'm like, my biggest flex would be to have a car with no automotive stickers on it at all. Just like random brand, you know? Yeah. Lowe's, CVS, like got Garmin. <laughs> you know, those would that would be the biggest flex out of anything because it's like, those are the hard ones. And those are the ones that are actually going to give you money because what else can they give you? They can't give you anything but money. Yeah. And because they don't know anything. Yeah. And the drift world is so like, that's why I'm always like, dude, what do, like SEMA, PRI, like there's so many people there talking to these same dudes, asking mm. the same thing. Like everyone's like, why do you only go to PRI for one day? Why do you only go to SEMA for two days? It's like, dude, w there's not a ton to do there. You go early in the week before these guys are sick and tired of seeing you or yeah. anybody 
you give them a quick five second thing to get their card. All you need from that is their card. Yeah. And then you leave. Like ideally though, it'd be best to have a contact there before you even go and have a meeting set up at SEMA after, you know, like a, Hey, in that thing we just talked about, where it's like, Hey, let's talk proposal. Maybe you do that proposal meeting in person at SEMA. That yeah. would be like yeah. perfect. Um, That's one thing that I didn't like s dedicate more time to for PRI. This was my first PRI okay. that I went to this year. So yeah. it was, I was all over the fucking place. <laughs> yeah, so like I, this was my first experience with it and I didn't really ask too, enough questions going into it to people. And so yeah, I learned my lessons, but I got a lot out of it too that I needed myself as well. So. It's, yeah yeah and you can That's filter quick there like okay are these way. people even interested in it but yeah i think Yo, this yeah. year we're really gonna try i mean i think if you're any sort of serious driver your partnership cycle should probably start in like early summer late spring like you should be looking for 25 partners in like june at and you know at least they're not gonna have budgets they're not gonna tell you what they can do for you yet but you need to make those connections get those big yeah, meetings set up people. be like hey um, I'd love to circle back in at SEMA, uh, yeah. and, and have a real conversation or this is, this is what we do. You can get all that like junk out of the way first. Can we even work with this company? Mm -hmm. Is it somebody like you, you should, I feel like ideally, and I'm absolutely do not do this, but I need to is like by October, probably September, you should have your list of like, this is a short list of people that we know we can do something for. We just need to go close these. Mm -hmm. And then you can go do that. Yeah. And that's another easy thing about businesses that aren't in the automotive world is they don't really have that same schedule because the automotive businesses sort of have this like cycle where, okay, we figure out budgets in the fall and the winter. And then in the spring, yeah. we give them to everybody. And then you go out and you do your things and then we figure it out again. And it's almost a race to get those dollars because they're getting assigned and assigned and assigned. And the later you are like right now it's February. Like if you're still trying to get money from an automotive company, like good luck. Um, yeah. but a non automotive company, they don't really have that same, obviously their budget is probably going to roughly follow like a calendar year cycle. And they're yeah, probably going to be thinking course. about budgets this time of year, but it'll follow more of the taxes. Yeah, exactly. Than anything. And I've seen a ton of companies that, non-automotive companies that are like dude we'll just give you money because we don't want to pay this in taxes like we'd rather just give this yeah. to you like we don't have all of our write-offs figured out yet so like i'd rather give you five grand than just pay the government five grand or like whatever and that really helps um but yeah i mean the, the whole marketing world is just such this crazy like nebulous daunting thing with drifting and it's like it's grown to be this fucking monstrosity yeah it's that huge it is now so it's that's yeah. why Social media is the root problem of it all. Yeah, but. there's no there's no handbook. I mean, there are, but there's no like FD does nothing to help you. They they that's not. I don't want to say that FD will give you plenty of resources and will help you as much as they can. But you have to ask. Yeah, yeah. And I think that not enough people ask. So I think that if I going back to this whole theoretical like most people are scared to ask. yeah like prospect advisor role you can almost be that go-between it's like i'm not scary yeah you can ask me the stupidest question you can think of and i'll either give you my advice and if i don't know it i'll go get an answer from somebody that does so yeah. like hopefully bring those guys out of the woodwork that might be too scared to ask or i think another thing with fd that is really crazy is guys might even brand new rookies might think they know a lot more than they do yeah you know like i'm at the point where you know, it's, I think it's called like the Dunning-Kruger effect, where if you ask like an expert pianist how good they are, they'll be like, I'm probably like a three. But if you add like out of 10, but if you ask somebody that's like an intermediate, they'll be like, I'm probably like an eight. Yep. Because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. Um, and I think Dude, that's a really that's big so thing in drifting. True, man. Yeah. Like guys will come into pro and be like, I know everything. It's like, first of all, not really. That's an <laughs> that's a counterproductive mindset. But like, um. Yeah, I've I've always wondered like, do people not ask because they're scared, or do they actually not ask because they think they know the right answer when they have nothing to prove that they actually know this? It's scary in an FD meeting to raise your hand when you've got Andy Luck, Ryan Sage, Ryan Lontane, you know, uh, Robbie Nishida, all yeah, the guys yeah. like just sitting there, and you're like, it is hard to get like that's what's so hard about FD. Is there's nobody. A lot of guys don't have mentors. I was lucky enough to be able to get some good mentors and have, you know, a positive influence when i was going into it but like a lot of guys they're just like showing up yeah. like you and i would show up to a grassroots event like that you've never been to before and it's like you don't know anybody 
they're very they're very scary. It's very hard. FD is a big change because everything's very structured there. Like you don't. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's gnarly. Yeah. It's gnarly, and there's so much that nobody talks about that it's it's so hard to just not even the driving. Yeah. It's just gnarly, and then yeah, you're at these crazy tracks, and you have four laps to figure it out, and <laughs> then you have one lap pretty much no, to qualify, it's... and you have to wait hours between all of that, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, like it is the most difficult like set of conditions to drive in ever outside of the driving yeah so well given all of the things that we've touched on for fd and ever just realistically drifting in general if you could boil down the top three things that someone that it has the balls to chase this fd dream what they should focus on going into their first fd event just three the main top three things mentor i assume is number one that's what I would suggest. Have myself. a dialed crew and or mentor. Fair. That's Fair. number one. You better have hours on the sim. Yeah. With good people. Your buddy that sucks, that's not that's not it. You gotta have good practice with good drivers on the sim. And you need to know your car and you need to have tested your car. Round one is not testing. Yeah. Believe it or not, because you show up and it seems like a lot of guys are doing that. So Make sure you have ample time to really know your <laughs> Finish car. Finishing bleeding the cooling yeah, system no, instead of the track. <laughs> these guys are showing up like these cars are like in the enclosed trailer on the drive, like fixing it. <laughs> You're like working. It's like, dude, don't get in over your head. And the number four is you better have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, if you've got there, you probably have some, but you better have a lot of free money. I'm not saying I do, but like it's been a team effort. Like it's I'm all in. My mom's all in everybody's all in yeah. on this and it's like we we're all willing to make those small sacrifices. yeah like my mom has been a huge 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 supporter and it's like not like she's a millionaire you know not like she's crazy well off you know we're just like committed to it yeah and it's nice that we don't because i would never do it if it was like actually like actually irresponsible like mm -hmm. i would never like miss payments on something or like whatever like that would stress me out too much it yeah, wouldn't be worth it anymore yeah. but i can do it to where like i can if i don't spend any money on anything else i can we can make it yeah. work and um yeah that's you better be prepared to spend a lot like seriously if you if you don't if you theoretically if, even before you get to pro prospect if you think to yourself could i come up with two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars through some way yeah if the answer is no, then you probably shouldn't do it. Like, yeah, think twice. <laughs> through the car, the trailer, the truck, even if you have a garbage truck, garbage trailer, yeah, super beat car, like you're going to spend that money. Yeah. I mean, you're almost probably going to spend more if you have that beat trailer, that beat like, truck, that beat everything people are like no dude i can do fd for five grand it's like no because the problem like the thing you do with it the thing about fd is like the better you do to the more expensive it is yeah like if you show up yep. and you don't qualify every time yeah it's pretty cheap because <laughs> we don't you know we have to Saved pay for all our tires, tires man, we have great. to pay for our tires that's the most expensive part um Damn. so um yeah like if you can't if you honestly and nick swan said this to me Nick Swan is is a longtime friend, a longtime mentor to me. Yeah. And um go watch his episode if yeah, you haven't. He's, he's a, a genius. Yeah. He in when I won in twenty seventeen, I, I won the first round of MDU at the time, the pro am round. And he was like, Do you want to do this? Like take it to the next level. And I was like, Maybe. And he's yeah. like, Can you come up with a hundred grand just to get there? And I was like, You're crazy. Like it's just not it's not gonna be that. Like you're insane. He was right. Sure enough. Sure enough. We <laughs> figured it out. You know, yeah. we figured out a way to do it. But like, no, I don't think people really talk about the money. Like, the money is something. Yeah. People talk. The people say it's. Expensive, I try and focus like, on it a lot. The this episode was other circumstances, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but because I feel like I've covered that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, especially to some of the pro one drivers and stuff too. So. Yeah. Yeah, money stuff is one thing that'll always be a hot topic. It's like it needs to be repeated and repeated, especially with how shit our economy is. <laughs> yeah, which that's a whole fucking rabbit hole that I won't go down. Yeah, I mean, just the, I want to scream <laughs> the, the cost the of everything rooftops about shit like that. Yeah, diesel. I mean, the biggest expense is tires, diesel, Airbnbs, yeah. and plane tickets for the guys. I mean, 
it's expensive. I bet the plane tickets get fucking ridiculous. Plane tickets are, you know, because a lot, you know, these guys, they're not, they're taking time out of their own jobs yeah. to do this. I'm not going to make them sit in a truck with me for two days to where they're taking time off or whatever for just to sit there. Like, obviously, I'm going to fly them out. And, yeah. um, like, a lot of these guys don't live where I live. Only one of my crew guys lives in Columbus. So they couldn't even, <laughs> you know, they, I couldn't even have them ride with me if I wanted them to. Yeah. It's very, all that stuff's really expensive. And I think, people just need to be honest with themselves about like and it's hard to talk about it without coming off like oh i've got money but like you yeah drifting drifting at any level is not a poor man's game yeah like no. you can do it cheap you can do it budget but like and you can have great success and have a ton of fun and have an amazing experience with drifting with like really low budget but like it's just expensive there's no way around that mm -hmm. there's just no way around yeah. it <laughs> like it's it, these things are cars you know that's going to be expensive <laughs> they're thousands of dollars as yeah. they come yeah so. i mean a lot of people ask me like oh dude how should i get into drifting and they'll be like um get a good job college kids or kids that might be or like guys that are like really scraping by like whatever and i'm like dude just get a sim yeah if you spend five grand on a sim and you don't have anything you don't have a computer you don't have anything if you spend five grand on a sim mm -hmm. you can have almost as much fun Obviously, drifting is so real life. Drifting is so like visceral and like. If you're that new to it, yes, I will say almost as much. You fun. could have an amazing sim experience. You can drive with pro drivers. You can compete. You can drive any track you want, any car you want. Yeah. Oh, FDs at Long Beach this weekend. I'm gonna try to drive Long Beach. Like you can have all these really cool experiences on the sim with a community. Hop on with your friends, play whenever, and have that be an amazing experience for you that then maybe in a few years when you are in a position to get a real car you can hop in and regard and that's not even being like oh it's going to set you up great for real life driving which it does but like yeah. regardless of even that you're going to come into drifting with such an amazing better platform than if you like scrape something together to get a 350z that you has to be your daily and oh my gosh yeah. it's annoying and like you're that is going to set you up in my opinion for a potentially worse drifting experience than if yeah, you would have that'll maybe, set you up for burnout a lot yeah. faster whereas a sim you can wait until you are financially in a better place to do that whether that means you're graduated college now or you're farther along in your career or yeah, yeah whatever to then you can do it in a right way which still doesn't have to be expensive but a right way where it's not eating away at your you know back of your mind like dude i'm putting some you know what i mean like <laughs> I think everybody should, I always will advocate that everybody should approach drifting in a healthy way and they should really be introspective and say like, is this, is this like right for me right now? Yeah. And maybe it's not right for you right now, but drifting's not going anywhere. Yeah. So, and still I think the sim. Here. Tracks are still going to be there. Exactly. Like the sim is that perfect half step to where you can have great, amazing fun. You can get really good. Yeah. And you can have this great fun experience without thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on stuff Dude, that that progression once you finally get into a car that you're gonna feel is gonna be so amazing too dude it's crazy oh, cole richards god. absolute dog sim god like yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i think he was simming before he was driving real life like the guys get so good nowadays like O'Sully, um connor O'Sully, he's yep. another like i saw him post a video on instagram he's like oh 2021 was my first time ever trying drifting and i'm like <laughs> bro damn <laughs> dude i couldn't even like use the handbrake until i was three years in like, <laughs> dude these guys are so good that's hilarious these guys are so 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 good after like very short amount of time very short amount of time and i think there's a lot of reasons for that but one of the i mean i know connor is a, a big sim guy as well yeah um and it, like it's crazy it's must have if you're serious about competitive driving or if you just want to have fun year round i mean i do thousands yeah. of laps in the winter oh dude i if it's almost i don't go a single day without thinking maybe i should buy a sim yeah just be just to have some of the days that i'm just like man i wish i could just throw a couple laps down dude it's great but video games really piss me off so yeah. it's, a, it's a hard thing in my head to dis discuss it's funny i said oh i always joke they've like unintentionally built in the drift car unreliability like into their software oh, yeah. so like something's like always messed up or like your wheel won't you're like your shifter won't connect like there's always some like funny quirky yep. little thing that's like you get you even get that realism of like 
drifting so unreliability. <laughs> it's so oh funny, God. but I don't know why, but the handbrake's not engaging today. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Fuck. They, they've so like poetically built that into their game, like unintentionally. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, but yeah. luckily, I, I, yeah, if you have no computer experience at all, you can still be successful. But, like, it definitely helps if you kind of know your way around a computer and like know your way around like basic troubleshooting and stuff like that. Cause there'll be guys I see that like have no idea about like, They've had like a cell phone their whole life, and now they bought this like gaming computer, and they're like, "What the do with them?" Oh like, yeah. So there's a lot to it, but yeah, it's it's so sick. It's and scary getting into computers. It is. I mean, it's very, very daunting. I th I have been building my own computers for so long, and I remember back when it was like not a cool thing. Now it's like everybody has a, you yeah. know, it's like it's a like a lifestyle PC. brand type thing. You know, these PC brands, it's crazy. But um, yeah, it's. I was, I was going somewhere with this that was going to be like funny or, inter or <laughs> insightful in some way, but um, it was about getting sim rigs. Yeah, like sim rigs. That, I mean, but... it's just it's it's. I highly recommend. Long story short, yeah, you should do it. Hell so. yeah! All right. Well, uh, I guess let's hit these um, the last questions that I do. I don't know if you've seen this question yet. So you have a stock version of your car. So with in this case, we'll just go with the E46. Um, so bone stock version, we'll say you have tires and you have $3,000 to spend at Njuku Racing to get the car ready for the very first track day ever. What parts would you prioritize to get that car ready for that first track day? With the three thousand dollars you have, uh, I'd get a set of BC coilovers. Yeah, shout out BC. BC. Forever. Um, shout out BC. Shout out my boy Chelsea for sure. Um, yep. I would do a seat, mm -hmm. steering wheel. Everybody's seen the Forsberg video, right? Get you a grip roll, dog. There you go. Yeah, get you a grip roll up in there. Um, and I wish grip roll would make fifteen inch steering wheels. By the way, Scott, if you're listening. Like a 15 inch one that's leather. <laughs> I would totally buy it. Um, and then I would do. We should just hit him up, actually. He <laughs> probably would be able to do that. Yeah, I have a. In my car, I have a 15 inch wheel that's leather because in the G, you have the stock steering wheel, which happens oh, to be 15 yeah. inches in leather. And I don't like the. Uh, I don't like suede with gloves because I feel like the whole point, or like. Oh, wow. Because the whole it. point of like gloves in racing is to have a good grip on the wheel. Mm hmm. But in drifting, you're trying to have the wheel like, some, like flow through your hands smoothly. Yeah. So the leather for me, I don't. I even like have, to have little effort of gripping it when I need it. I don't even have to let go I of the wheel. I can float it however I need. I can just like let go, and the leather like goes through my gloves. <laughs> and it's, God, it's so perfect. Yeah, it makes I love it. it. <sighs> but uh, that was like a recent thing for me. And the bigger the wheel, the slower it's gonna feel like it's moving. Yeah, so it, I yeah. like that too. But anyway, good wheel, good seat, uh, weld the diff with some of that money. I don't know if they sell like a plate kit for the E36 diff, but or whatever. I would do that, and then um, coilovers for sure. For a BMW, I would get uh, rear trailing arm bushings. I would get subframe reinforcement plates, probably if they're not because <laughs> most E46. All of this for the first track day, though. Rear trailing arm bushings, got, yeah. Remember, you only got three three grand to play okay. with. So. BC BRs, that's a grand. You got two yep. grand left. Get yourself a seat about five hundred. Super, bucks. yeah, five hundred dollars seat steering wheel with a quick release. You're probably in that. Another five. Let's probably. just say five to make it easy. So then you have a thousand bucks left. Yeah, I would do. So you've got. Let's just say that your buddy welded the diff. Um, I would do rear trailing arm bushings for sure because, like, those in every BMW are like cooked, like. <laughs> so bad yeah like almost probably dangerously bad um those are going to be if you use my 20 dollar camry bushing thing that what well, doesn't count towards your budget but if you have to use <laughs> an injuku part i'm sure they sell a ton of good bushings you can get like a synchro design works is a great yeah. brand or whatever and then um honestly you'd probably be set with that yeah uh, I'd I say so. I think somebody probably sells like just a little plate if you want angle, but I did my first whole year with an S14 with no angle kit and it was fine. I don't think you need yeah. it. I think E46s have from some pretty decent angle from the factory. Too. Yeah, and I feel like they don't have enough power like to well, use yeah. angle. No. You need to be skirting around. But uh, I think you could be, you could have a great track day for less than that, less than three grand energy. Oh, yeah. And easy, then you could easy. save, uh, take that extra money 
and that you saved and maybe put it into like the other parts that always break on BMWs, like the coolant overflow or whatever. I don't know. I've never yeah, had a stock yeah, yeah. BMW. Yeah. I'm actually not well versed in like stock BMW stuff. I've just like ripped it all out and <laughs> put fancy parts uh, on it. But um, yeah, that would be I, that'd be a sick car. Yeah. Basically, look. I at only what, asked the question just to preface how simple it actually is to get the car ready for the first track. Oh, dude, you can get you don't into, need much money yeah. to work with. You could get, you could take any car. Like my G is a great example. That car has BCBR coilovers. It's got a seat mm -hmm. that I got out, the expired Momo that I got from one of, that I took from another car. It's got the stock steering wheel. It's got a welded diff. It's got the like diff brace, which is like 75 bucks. Yeah. And it's got the GK Tech angle bracket, which is 250 bucks. Yeah. That's all it has. It's bone stock, air filters to exhaust tips, engine wise, like bone stock. Um, and it's got a fire extinguisher, obviously, and that's it. And you could build, you could recreate that car in your garage with like a most the ba most basic hand tool set, yeah, and a barely any knowledge of cars. And on that, if for the rear setup, the rear alignment specs, the easiest way for more well, the most budget friendly way is if you do go true rear, delete the bucket and get the um fuck what was it the camber arm. And those are the only two. The toe arm yep, and the camera yep. arm is the only two arms you need in the yep. rear to get whatever spec you need. Exactly. So you could do that. Yeah, that's a good point. You do need the toe and the camber in the back. And then, which is a bonus to the BMW, because I don't even think you would need that. You might need mm. a camber arm, but that's cheap. And then, yeah, I mean, you're ready to rip. Yeah. And I've driven so that car. I haven't touched it since. And I've done, I have a clicker, like a counter. Yeah. And I've done like 1,300 laps in that car. Damn. And all I've done is change the oil. I did put an oil cooler on it later, but like that would still be under three grand for all that, probably. Maybe like four grand for sure under that. And you're <laughs> and that's a car that could take you from never having drifted before to tandeming with you know, yeah, I won I won Drift Indy Street League in that car. Yeah. Like there you, you go. could go and win competitions in that same car without ever touching it. Yep. Crazy. You know, if you wanna rip the engine out and put a two J in it and blow it up six times. And then decide to sell it and buy another stock one. <laughs> be my guest, and I'm sure you'll be much more appreciative of the stock one once you have it again. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, that's my. <laughs> or listen to his advice if you can, and run with it. Yeah, but you'll always do what makes you uh, happy first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's my advice. Hell yeah! All right. Well, uh, speaking of advice, let's get your best piece of advice for anyone just getting into drifting. I know you touched that a tiny bit, but yeah um, yeah i would say do it for yourself identify what you care about in drifting mm -hmm. because i think it's really hard to separate what you actually care about in drifting versus what the culture tells you you should care about in drifting so figure out what do you really like about this and just work on it and just enjoy it mm -hmm. um what i don't care what that looks like in terms of the car you buy or the complexity of the build i'll always say you know, keep it simple, prioritize seat time, all the things that everybody's going to tell you. Yeah. But have fun, whatever that looks like for you, do that and just enjoy it. Never set, you can set aspirational goals, but be where your feet are. Just enjoy the journey. It's going to be one of the most amazing things you've ever done. Like it changed my life in every single way. Mm -hmm. um, and I really just would say focus on enjoying that and living in the moment and Live each the life like you're in the good old days. Yeah, exactly. Like, cause it seriously is like, enjoy every single moment of it. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be so rewarding and it's going to feel great to have a purpose that's so well-defined and like yeah. just cherish that. And, um, that would be my advice. I don't care what you want to drive. I would always say, you know, start out with something practical. Mm -hmm. You always want to start out with something that's going to set you up the best to enjoy it. Yeah. You know, a bone stock FCR X7 with the NA stock motor. Might not be the best choice. You know, but... maybe that might hinder <laughs> your that's fun what you a little love, bit. But yeah, if that is means. truly like your dream car and you want to save up and buy one of those and, and you don't care about the theoretical maximum of that on a drift track, like. Yeah. Who cares? Mm -hmm. That's that's my big thing. Is like just don't don't let anybody tell you 
how to have fun in drifting, mm -hmm. respect the culture in drifting, respect that your car should look nice, respect that you should be, you know, keeping it on the track. Yeah. I would never, you know, the sideshow stuff, which is becoming hugely popular, like that's not what drifting is. Mm -mm. Please stop. You know, me. yeah, like respect. Fuck those people. <laughs> respect the culture at a high level. Yeah. What is the drifting culture? Being nice to people, having a nice car that, you know, the way I always see it is like, I see my car as a reflection of myself. So if you have a really beat up crappy car, like that's a negative reflection on you in my opinion. So just have a car that you're proud of, that you would be okay with showing off to somebody yeah. that doesn't have to take a lot of money. No, like, not at all. You can make spray paint, zip ties are cheap. Yeah. Make it one color, make it look nice. It doesn't have to be slammed. Like we're not, it's not a competition of how low can you get your drift car, <laughs> you know? Just like how, respect the, the, the culture, but make your journey your own. Yeah. Don't just try to live off what you think is cool or what you think people will like or what you think will make you popular in drifting mm -hmm. because you're just going to get burnt out and not like it and be disappointed. So take his advice. Good ones. So hell yeah, dude. Uh, well, then last one is your one message just to the entire world. If you have one, I would say just, man, this is a very like, theoretical episode yeah, it's, <laughs> um, yeah i was like hopefully this translates well because i was this is how i wanted it to go <laughs> but um <laughs> i hope that people watching this are like dude what is he on but no this is good you're good because i think a lot of people just talk about the stuff that everybody thinks about um and i i um anyway <laughs> i'm like over here like ranting one message for the world dude, I, like same thing like just figure out what you enjoy and just pursue that and have a healthy one thing that i'll say is like any, what i've learned especially in the last like six months is life is all about balance yeah and just finding that balance in everything in your life is so important and when you find balance and you approach everything from a healthy mindset and you try to have a healthy relationship with everything you do and you're kind to yourself yeah your life's gonna be good you know i think everybody no matter where you are in life are capable of being happy yeah. So that's my advice for everybody. Just have fun. Good shit. Don't take it seriously, too seriously, and just enjoy it for you. Do it for you. Awesome. That's good advice, too. Well, if you want, uh, plug yourself, plug your sponsors, people, anyone, anyone else you want to shout out? Yeah, sure. Um, if you want to hit me up for anything, any clarification of anything we've talked about today or just any advice – whether you're brand new drifting, prospect, whatever your goals are, hit me up. My Instagram is at Jeff underscore drifts. I'm sure that'll be linked somewhere. That's the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, and far as shout outs go, I want to shout out my buddy, Ben, who's really helped me through this partnership process and been a really core part of the program the last year and an amazing friend. Uh, Brian, my crew chief, CMJ, my spotter, all those guys for riding with me. And, uh, you know, i I really want just to reinforce how much I appreciate those guys. Chris Scherzer, absolute legend. Um, obviously, Chad. Those guys are amazing. Edgar, everybody at Drift Indy, everybody in the Midwest, you're all my boys. <laughs> um, so hopefully we can bring back a championship for you guys this year. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. Oh, yeah, dude. That's so. awesome. I love it. All right, well, uh, I guess look below the video. Make sure uh, you are subscribed and that button's not still red and hit the bell notification while you're at it so you are always updated with every episode. Um, and, of course, don't forget about the Bums giveaway. Comment, like each video until the end of March. Uh, and then, as always, the links to all the parts that we discussed and stuff, most of them, mostly all the shit you see on the wall, can be found at Injuku Racing. But that's all we got for this week. I will see you each and every Sunday for a new episode. Thanks. Staying way up, up, up to the ceiling. Trust no bitch, can't catch no feelings. I've been taking long flights from the bay to Ibiza. Hit home runs, I'm a ball like Jeter. I just want to fuck, 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 then I leave. I'm a young pop star, caught a boy, doesn't be. Got a little 